The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan Podcast by night, all day. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Maxwell, fresh from Australia, international man of mystery, world traveler, trainer of the stars. You're out there, buddy. Good day, mate. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, they call it Straya, S T R Y A. Straya. I was. I That's was, how they say it. I was checking out my uh, my. Australian memes, you know, all the uh, Australian slang. Pretty funny, man. You can go online, Google this stuff. There's some of the sayings they have are absolutely hilarious. So you were telling me before the show that you just started getting into THC, a.k.a. marijuana. You know, it's funny. I'm a child of the 60s and the 70s, and, you know, that was the huge hippie era. Right. And I was a wrestler. I was like, you know, hardcore athlete, wrestled NCAA Division One. And uh, for me at that time, I believed all the anti-propaganda. You know, I was a pretty straight-laced guy. And uh, so, you know, oh, it's a gateway drug. And oh, my God, you're going to go to hell in a handbasket. And, you know, this stuff will destroy your brain. And, and uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. You've heard it all, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, what was that? What was that really funny uh, anti-marijuana movie that they had back in the Reefer day? Reefer Madness? Reefer Madness. Yeah, that was an I awesome I actually, one. we had to watch that in health class when I was in high school. That really? Was, yeah, that was part of the uh, school curriculum back in the 60s. So they showed it to you like as yeah. if it was real? Yeah, like it was real. We all believed that stuff. <sighs> Remember, I was from little uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, you know? That's amazing. That's like a hick town. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just recently started, how recent uh just about maybe six months ago what happened what started it off you know i just had so many friends that were into it and it, it's interesting because i made observations uh i've been in brazilian jiu-jitsu now for oh my god since 89 how many years is that like a, a lot, lot of years. yeah 20 something yeah okay 26 what is that 26 oh my well almost every bjj champ that i know was totally into marijuana they you would use it to relax because it's mm -hmm. such an intense sport, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, it's such an extremist thing. I mean, what do you do? You go out and try to hurt someone as much as possible with joint locks and so forth, mm -hmm. or you choke them to sleep, right? Of course, that being said, I had way more injuries with uh, college wrestling than I ever did with, with jiu-jitsu because you can always tap. Right. But I just noticed that these guys, you know, it's an intense sport, uh, maybe not as intense as MMA, but certainly up there. And they all would light up at night and so forth. And, you know, they'd have their bongs or, you know, roll up a, a joint. And I, I could just never figure this out. It just would blow my mind. Right. And over time, I just got more and more curious. So um, I, had, I had a lot of friends in Australia that were really totally into this also. And um, I just decided, you know what? Maybe I'm missing something here. <laughs> you know? Now that I'm in my 60s, you know? <laughs> I missed the 60s, so I mean my 60s, so I'm, I'm going to check this out. So I started playing around. Got one of those. Um, what I didn't like was the smoke. I mm -hmm. found it really irritating. But I tried one of those. Uh, they call it the vape. It's like a little square box with a little straw. It looks like, mm -hmm. um, it looks like a little kid's juice box. you know? Right, right. <laughs> Adult juice box. They have a bunch of those now. They have pens that like they look like... Uh... Like some sort of a metal cylinder with like a lip on the end of it, and you and you, you pack it with either oil that you can buy pre um, pre filled little tubes of of hemp oil or THC oil, and you stick it in there, and it it has some sort of an element in there, and it heats it up, and you just breathe it in vapor. It's just a vaporizer, a portable vaporizer. So yeah, I was just very curious, and uh, well, I, I mean, I, I you you've been into this for a long time, very open about it, and I thought well. You are really into your health and your body, and you take great care of yourself. And I figured, you know, if it's really all that harmful, Joe wouldn't be doing this. There's no way that you would do something like that. Yeah, I was with you. I mean, I, before I started smoking pot, I was in the same boat. I really thought it was for idiots. I thought it was for people that just wanted to escape reality. They were weak. They couldn't handle it. They just wanted to get drugged out. I, I thought about it the same way I think about pain pills today. Like I, I've, I took 
I've had three knee surgeries. My first major one, my first ACL was a patella tendon graft, which is kind of, it's particularly painful because they slice your patella tendon, they cut a chunk out of your kneecap and a chunk out of your shin bone, and then they drill it all in place and screw it in place. It's good because it's a native piece of tendon, so it, 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 it adheres to the body very quickly, and there's very little chance of rejection, and it's very strong. But uh, it's very painful. And they gave me a prescription for Vicodins or some shit. I took one of them, one. And I remember sitting on the couch feeling so stupid and foggy. And I said, I am done with this. My other two um, surgeries, my, uh, my other ACL and my other meniscus surgery, I didn't take anything. My knee, my uh, nose, when I had my nose fixed, I had my um, deviated septum fixed and my turbinates cut out, my nose stretched out and they put tubes in it and everything, nothing. I didn't take anything, just pot. And um, I don't like, I don't like anything that leaves me like cloudy. And that seems like, that's what I thought pot was. I thought pot was something that left you stupid or cloudy. And it's really just, it's the opposite. It, it tunes you in. I was shocked. I was utterly shocked. The first thing I noticed was my vision improved. I've, I've been nearsighted most of my life, and uh, I, I basically found my eyes were getting worse each year, getting stronger prescriptions. I finally read this book, Take Off Your Glasses and See, and uh, I just basically threw my glasses in the trash. Really? And started doing eye strengthening exercises. Like and what they, kind of they, them? I'm going through that right now myself. Uh, they improved a lot. Uh, there's a lot of different exercises you can do, but... Uh, the, the name of the book is Take Off Your Glasses and See. Hmm. And this guy was a disciple of uh, the Bates method of uh, eye, eye strengthening. Mm -hmm. But when I was at the summit of the Breath Masters in Moscow, they had a bunch of guys there that uh, were using uh, breathing and eye exercise and all sorts of stuff for the improvement of vision. One was a former uh, specialist sniper, so I guess he knows a thing or two about vision training. Yeah. And he, he was showing some of the eye exercises he does, you know, real simple stuff. And it was like, wow, this works, but only to a point. It got really good to the point where I can drive during the day. i would still a little reluctant to drive at night. I mean, I could, but I can't read street signs at night. Wow. During the day, I can actually see signs, uh, but I'm a little reluctant. Mm -hmm. And the, um, what I noticed with the, when I would take the THC, I was using one of those vaporizer things. It was like my eyes would start to really clear which leads me to believe that it has something to do with muscular tension. I noticed that my digestion would improve. And instead of getting foggy, like I would be on my iPad, maybe doing an email or something, it, it's like somehow my fingers would just glide over the keys and just magically find the letters way faster, or at least my perception of how much faster. I don't know. It was just a very interesting experience. Well, one of the things that people use it for with jujitsu is not just to relax after training, but before training because it focuses you in a very tunnel vision sort of a way. When uh, I roll, when I smoke pot and roll, I feel like I'm better at jujitsu. I really do. I feel like more relaxed. I feel not just more relaxed. I feel like I'm more sensitive. I'm like more in tune with what's going on. I'm also I love stretching on it. That's one of my favorite things to do. I love eating one of those things, those jambos I just gave you. Yeah, that's a, um, it's interesting. I haven't tried eating it yet. That's an all organic, edible uh, THC, you know, marijuana little cake thing. And it's all with natural honey and all natural ingredients. It's like probably the healthiest of all these edible ones. Because a lot of these edible ones are using processed sugars and, you know, high fructose corn syrup and stuff. It's not good for you. So this guy who created these, he decided, you know, there's got to be a market for an organic version of these marijuana Something, edibles. Yeah. yeah. So that's much healthier for your body. But it's it's really strong. Be careful. Yeah, no, I'm going to be very careful. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I have not, uh, in truth, taken it before I've trained. But I read uh, about the guy in Colorado, the triathlete. Mm -hmm. uh, He's a world-class athlete, um, very elite, and he, he's been really advocating taking it before endurance training. Somehow it improves uh, uh, pain threshold, your, your tolerance to physical exercise pain, not pain pain, right. but like exercise-induced discomfort. It from, changes the way your body reacts. It changes the way your body reacts in, in any sort of – when I work out with it, if I lift weights with it, 
I like, I can feel the fibers, or at least I feel like I'm feeling, I feel the fibers of my muscles. I'm very sensitive to it, which is one of the reasons why I really enjoy doing it before I stretch. And Terrence McKenna, who is a late great psychedelic philosopher, he, it was his contention that yoga itself was really a how to use cannabis manual. And that the way to optimize your experience with cannabis was through yoga. Because all of those sadhus, all those guys are just hash smoking freaks. They're all like one of, that's like the dark secret of the sadhus, he would say, is what they really concentrate on is how many chillums can you smoke before you pass out? And they, you know, you're not a man unless you can go deep, deep, deep into the rabbit hole. Yeah. And, <laughs> and these guys would smoke massive amounts of hash and do yoga. And, you know, I, I used to think, well, wow, that's kind of crazy. Like, I guess they're just having fun and doing it until the one time I did yoga when I was high. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. It's like I, I can relax more. I get deeper into poses. And also I feel like I feel the, the resistance. Like a lot of uh, Pavel uh, talks about this as well. I don't know how to say his last name. How do you say his last Sat name? Satsoling. Satsoling, who's a, uh, one of the most famous advocates of the kettlebell. He uh, talked about stretching being a big part of what holds you back is uh, tension, psychological tension, not necessarily even flexibility, but that you're yeah, worried your about Your the... brain sets up that stretch reflex Yeah. when you're in an unfamiliar position. So it's, you know, it's saying danger. You're in a different position than you're used to being in. Yeah. And for most of us, that's sitting in chairs or most most people right yeah that's the most yeah that's the most common position right and when your head's in between your legs and you're stretching your hamstrings out you know you your body's resist. a little threatened by that yeah man. your body's like what are you doing there buddy tense it up tense it up um what he was saying was that it's all about like breathing like resist and then relax resist and then relax but that resist and relax is enhanced, I don't know how many fold when you're on marijuana. I mean, it's wow. amazing how deep you go into stretches and how good it feels afterwards. It's this weird state you reach when you do yoga or any type of deep stretching on marijuana. I'm a huge, huge fan of that. Well, listen, I'm a neophyte, man. Uh, teach me, master. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think I, it's listen, amazing. Man, never let it be said that Steve Maxwell doesn't... Uh, experiment you know i i really think that one of the secrets to aging well is to be open-minded and just to experiment and learn new things try new things and don't mm. be such a stick in the mud with with your belief systems you know yeah don't get hard. so holier than thou with all all your beliefs because hey man you know if you think about it a lot of really high spiritual adepts they they all use some type of either you know uh, hallucinogen or we, we talked last time on the show about ayahuasca mm -hmm. and so forth and and you know the sh the shamans using their uh, mushrooms and well, I think as you get older I think especially when you have been around a lot of fools you reach a certain point in your life where <clears throat> you don't want to tolerate any nonsense and you're just like ah enough of this nonsense like what you need is you know a night a good diet you don't need any supplements you don't need any hooey in your life you don't need any BS just get out of bed and go out and do it just and, do it and that that sort of mentality serves you well but in having that mentality and meeting all these fools, sometimes you can kind of develop prejudices. You, you develop these ideas that aren't necessarily based on data. It's more based on like sort of just your perceptions of the people that are around you. Like if you see enough losers that do something, you say, well, that's for losers. You see enough losers that are smoking pot, you think, well, pot is for losers. It's obvious. Like look at all these losers smoking pot. And then you meet like BJ Penn. You're like, wait a minute, hold on. BJ Penn gets high and does jujitsu? Like, what? what's going on there? And then you you know, you you, you find out that ninety percent of the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu champions are smoking pot. Yeah, and they rolling. all relax with this stuff, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's an it's a performance enhancer. There was actually an article recently about ultra marathoners. Jamie, see if you could pull that up because it was I forget what uh, publication it was in, but it was a big article where People were really being uh, really shocked at these the results and these guys that were ultra marathoners that were advocating smoking marijuana and they were talking about should this be banned from ultra marathons? Well, out outside magazine also uh, I think could have been outside. Yeah, oh there it, it is. It was at Fox News right here. Yeah, there we a go. A bunch of different things. Yeah. 
marijuana has benefits, but is it ethical? Yeah, see, this is the thing. Yeah, God damn well, it, people. Of course it's ethical. Is Are vitamins ethical? Is fruit ethical? Is caffeine ethical? Yeah, it's a goddamn plant. I mean, these people are all on caffeine, by the way. Here's the dirty secret about marathon runners. Ultra, I have a buddy who is my friend Cameron Haynes. is a fanatical runner. He runs 10 miles a day, sometimes 15. He does marathons. He's done an ultra marathon. I think he's gearing up for another ultra marathon. He's a maniac. And it, he's always hopped up on the caffeine, always. But he has a job, like a regular job, and he can't touch the pot. And I've been telling him about all this, and he's like, maybe there's another good reason why I should quit my job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, there's another uh, very interesting thing I've been experimenting with but for years, and that's the, uh, the theta brainwave meditation, mm -hmm. where you actually, uh, your brain produces different levels of brainwaves. Uh, your brain oscillates at certain speeds and different parts of the brain produce different, you know, like alpha, beta, gamma, delta, theta. Mm -hmm. But theta is the, like the one that's most closely associated with that sort of between sleep and wakefulness when the subconscious mind can be programmed. And uh, there's a lot of really good programs out there that produces a beat. And then your brain starts to adapt and copy the beat and you can slow the brain wave down. That's what I did in the plane. I just, like I said, I flew in from Sydney, like 14-hour flight, man, and didn't really get that much sleep. But I did one of those uh, binaural beats, theta brainwave meditation. Now, and, when you do this, you're wearing headphones? Uh, yeah, yeah. I actually was using uh, Bose uh, earbud noise cancellations and just sitting there with my iPhone and just, wow, zoning. And you, when you come out of it, you feel like you just had a refreshing sleep. Really? It's, yeah, it's very, very relaxing. Speaking of relaxation. And so for those folks that uh, are still a little leery about maybe trying something like THC, <laughs> you can do this with the theta brainwave meditation. All, all the brainwaves like, have their benefits. The alpha is like what we're in right now, the alpha and the, uh, the beta, like while we're awake. Gamma is like when you're in a real deep sleep, like a real deep dreamlike state. The theta is like that twilight. You know, when you're, th this is, when, when people meditate, they go into a theta brainwave uh, state. But by listening, you could meditate like a monk your first time out, man. Wow. Yeah, it, it doesn't require any special breathing or postures or anything. You could just literally sit or lie down comfortably and you just go into the zone. And if you do practice visualization or if you practice uh, any kind of affirmations or, subconscious mind programming, it's a great time to do it, man. So you're listening to a program. What is the name of the program and how do you get well, it? Well, there's a whole bunch of different ones, you know. Uh, you can go to Amazon or iTunes and, and just look for Theta Brainwave Meditation. I'd recommend maybe people just go on, um, you know, just Google it mm -hmm. and look at the different, I mean, there's so many different companies out there now. You can get CDs, you can get uh, M, um, uh, MP3s, MP3s. Uh, you can download it on iTunes. I have it on my iPhone. That's about great. A dozen programs, and it's really handy for for guys like us because you do your fair share of travel. Mm. Uh, when you have to adapt to a new time zone, and you, it's pretty hard to sleep in some of these planes sometimes. Yeah, it's hard for me to sleep on planes. It's also hard for well, you know, if if I'm tired, I can conk out pretty much anywhere. I, I can yeah. lie down on the floor. It goes, but um, it's hard for me um, when I have to do something in like three hours, and I know, well, I could take a nap right now for two hours. Good luck. Yeah, I'm almost never. Makes you feel able worse to. than if you didn't take it at all. Yeah, I, just, I lie there and I go, "Come on, go to sleep. Come on." And I usually can't get there. Well, you slap the earphones on with your your binaural beats. That's just like a one one of the programs. Is what like, does it sound like? Um, well, sometimes they use music. You can hear like an underlying beat. It's just underneath the conscious hearing. And, but you can, you can kind of hear like a little rhythm going on. And sometimes they'll have beautiful kind of angelic, you know, music. Uh, sometimes they just have like sounds of the ocean, you know, like ocean waves. Incredibly relaxing. And you just find yourself zoning. And when you finish the program, you really do feel like you had just a very nice, refreshing sleep. And wow. you feel quite, quite excellent. So they they vary in the sounds, but the beat stimulates the same part of the brain. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of different techniques. Uh, one uh, one of the techniques they have a different uh, rhythm going in each ear. Wow! So the right and left hemispheres have to synchronize with each other. What if you're bipolar? 
can find I, I don't know, man. Probably not a good idea. <laughs> Man, you know, I'm, I'm, I, maybe I'm, it'll I, sort you out. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a brain scientist, but I have been doing this for a bunch of years with uh, good results. But I don't know if maybe if you have a mental illness or a bipolar or something. But they do claim that uh, it, it regulates your hormonal levels. Really? Yeah. And there's even there's uh, even to the point of producing uh, growth hormone and so forth. Have you ever messed around with any of those? Um, do you know what a turbosonic is? It uses sound waves through the base of a platform. You stand on this, and it and it takes you through a bunch of different cycles. I have, and it's sound, but you don't hear it. It's like it, you're you're standing on a speaker. yeah. You're just getting it's like vi- shaking. You're just getting vibed. Yeah. I love that thing. I have one of those things in my house, and it's supposed to like do all sorts of things as far as stimulate the production of various hormones and uh, you know and aid healing and circulation but it makes you feel great like, well there's even ways the you can just exercise and 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 do vibrations and so mm-hmm. forth you know and trampolines are really good for that right yeah yeah i mean the taoist yogis and the Qigong um, uh, practitioners have been doing similar things with their own bodies i mean obviously the platform makes it much more convenient. Oh, it's 10 minutes. You get right. on that sucker for 10 minutes and you're like, <laughs> it goes through all these different, like it'll do like 10 seconds at one and then 10 seconds at another and then very fast, high frequency and then low and slow and shaking up and down. And when it's over, you're like, God, I feel so I feel good. fantastic. Yeah, it's wild. But uh, yeah, like Feldenkrais, he was, you know, they have like a, 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 a bouncing, shaking, vibrational kind of thing. Thing. And there's, uh, uh, like I said, the Taoist yogis have a, a thing where they do this kind of stuff. Uh, when I was in Russia, they 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 had like as part of their uh, Slavic Russian Russian health system, their mobility stuff. They would have shaking and vibrations and and all the stuff that you just kind of do to yourself. And I read this guy uh, Alexander Lowen. He was uh, like a psychiatrist that treated people with uh, with uh, chronic mental problems with uh, exercise and so forth and really he was really big into shaking and moving the body and all these interesting patterns and it's very relaxing it just gets a lot of the tension out and I agree with you I I do believe it it does help facilitate uh, recovery I think mental problems and relaxation are so often not connected with each other mental problems and exercise and exertion and the fact that a lot of people a lot of their tension comes from not releasing energy and their body stores up this energy like a battery and then it's leaking all over the place and it's just like they're short circuiting when you see people screaming in traffic and you know and cutting people off and all this madness that i mean it really is like a form of madness when you see someone screaming at someone that's not even anywhere near them in traffic the stress levels just get so much and yeah. a lot of that goes also back and we talked about this last time too about your breathing patterns mm-hmm. Most people, and I, I do seminars all over the world, and we test ourselves to see what type of breather we are. That's like one of the things we do first. And almost everybody in the seminar is like a covicular breather. They're using the emergency apparatus of the upper <laughs> neck and chest, shallow breathing. Panic breathing. And it's panic breathing. And all those emergency receptors are in the upper lobes of the lungs, and they're not bringing the O2 down into the lower lobes. So they're in a chronic panic they're in a heightened state of vigilance all the time that's exhausting man and it does all sorts of weird things to your hormones and it definitely you it's hard to be in a good mood and relaxed when you're in this panic state your subconscious mind doesn't know that there's not like a, a threat looming over the horizon so everything that happens is perceived as a threat every little comment you know someone cuts you off in traffic people take it so personally because it's it's a threat because they're all caught up in the chest. And man, I'm telling you, when you learn to do proper diaphragmatic breathing and bring the breath down to the lower lobes of the lungs, it's incredibly calming. You know, you do that with... So what what do you recommend if someone is looking into doing something like that? Is there a book that you recommend or a program? Do you have a well, video? Well, get to or one anything? of my seminars. <laughs> yeah, one of your seminars. And now I do a lot of uh, breath work. You know, well, Master Hicks and Gracie now. Uh, if, I mean, for years he never showed us his breathing system. You know, he'd be kicking our ass and doing this kind of weird breathing. And I used to think, uh, is he making fun of me? You know, that's kind of this weird kind of thing he was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. Almost, yeah. All, all, you know, Hoyce, Hoyle, you know, they all knew how to do this. And they weren't teaching us blue and purple buds at the time. But uh, now he's spending a lot of time teaching. I, I heard that Kron also is spending a lot of time because I think it's really, really important for combat athletes to, you know, learn to relax. And the way you relax in combat is through breath manipulation. But as far as actually being taught, I haven't seen it. The, the Sistema guys do a pretty good job with it, you know. But uh, it's funny because, you know, I started really getting into this and reading a lot. Um, but I wasn't reading stuff related to combat as much as mostly yoga stuff, you know, or Qigong. So, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to find the information. Yeah, it is. It's hard to find information. It's hard to know, like, what's the best program for you. I guess you have to try a few different ones to try find a few out different. What, what you enjoy or what what seems to benefit you. But I think um, when you, especially when you're dealing with uh, martial arts and you're dealing with uh, training and especially competing, you're dealing with extremely stressful situations where your body is pushed at a, a very high pace where, you know, you, you reach the point of exhaustion and then you have to continue for, you know, three, four minutes while you're exhausted. Everyone who's ever rolled has experienced that. You know, you're doing maybe a seven or nine minute roll, <clears throat> which uh, means uh, grappling sparring for the uninitiated. And uh, a lot of times you're two, three minutes in, if, if, especially if you're rolling with someone good and you are exhausted. Totally exhausted. And you got to figure out a way to get to a clinch and just... <sighs> and try to bring your heart rate down and try to do just enough to defend and keep moving but not enough to totally tax out your muscles and also don't let your mind get into that panic state like and uh, the breath is what controls that yeah because if you can't breathe you're gonna freak yeah i remember um training with a, a guy who was uh, like a real athletic guy a very strong guy but he hadn't done jiu-jitsu before and so he was really excited to learn it and try to get into jiu-jitsu and you know he's in there sparring and he asked me to spar and I'm like okay all right you know uh, how long are you doing it now he's like oh, a couple months and this and that I'm just getting into it I'm just starting to spar I'm like all right let's go and uh, so we start. I, I remember I got to a position, I like mounted him, and I could feel him just full panic. His body locked up. And I, I remember I'd never felt, because I'm not usually rolling with someone who's that inexperienced. So to do like a raw white belt, it's only been doing it for a short period of time. He really didn't know what to do. And he was just locked up. And I'm like, just calm down, just breathe, breathe just breathe. Like you, you know, it's not gonna help you. Like this is definitely gonna hurt you. You're gonna, you're gonna get tapped out either way. But if you, if you breathe in, you're gonna be able to keep going, and you're gonna be able to learn. And I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through shit. I'll tell you what, to, what to not do, where to put yourself. But this, <laughs> you can't ever let that happen, ever. Even if you're gonna lose, even if you're, you're, you're gonna get tapped out, don't ever let yourself freak. You can't freak. And in a real emergency, let's mm. say some type of street altercation where, I mean, maybe there's a lot more on the line than a trophy or a medal or, you know, or like your life. Or your ego in like, class. Yeah. Like your life. Yeah. Um, yeah, knowing how to breathe and keep calm is mm. really, really, really important. Very important. Keep, keep your mind clear. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot of practice, and you have to do it. And there's a lot of really cool breathing exercises that you can do, even just walking, jogging, you know, even with your exercises and so forth. Yeah, everyone can lose. Anyone, especially that's learning and developing, you can lose, and you're probably going to lose, whether it's in sparring or whether it's in competition, when you come up against someone who's better than you. But there's a big difference between losing and losing composure and breaking, you know, that, that term breaking, when you feel a guy give up. We've all seen it, we've seen it in fights, <clears throat> and some guys just don't break. Like, here's a perfect example. John Jones doesn't break. He just doesn't break. You know, he might take breathers, he might, but he is, he is, he, in his mind, he's the greatest of all time, he's gonna figure out how to beat you, it's a foregone conclusion, he's not gonna tap. Like when he fought Vitor Belfort, Vitor Belfort caught him in a beautiful arm bar from the guard and had his arm completely hyperextended, ruined his arm. I mean, his arm, John's arm was fucked up for like months afterwards. He had to take a gig on the Ultimate Fighter and coach for a long time because he wasn't able to train and he, wasn't, he was not gonna be able to fight for at least like six months to let that arm heal. 
but it didn't matter. He was, he was not going to tap. Like, he was going to get his arm broken, and he was going to still win. He was going to find a way to win. He is not breaking. And then there's other guys, the first moment where things go wrong, you see this look in their eye, they're like, oh, shit, it's going wrong. They lose composure. And, like, these, these doors that you go into with your mind, you get real comfortable entering these doors. You get real comfortable entering these these areas of the mind. And this can apply to all aspects of your life, I think. Well, like Jacare got, you know, when he fought uh, Roger, that perfect example. Perfect he, example. He did. He wanted the win. Mm -hmm. He took the, the damage to the elbow, fought one arm just to eke out the, the victory that was... Yeah. Now, but I think for, for, for folks who don't know what we're talking about, Hodge Gracie, one of the very best black belts in the world, and Jacques Array, one of the very best black belts in the world. Was it in the Mundials? Yeah, I believe it was. I think it was the Open Finals. Yeah, it was a huge Brazilian Jiu Jitsu World Championship, and Hodger broke Jacare's arm. And Jacare just tucked that sucker in his belt and kept going. Kept going. I mean, he only had, crazy. like, I don't know, 30 or 40 seconds. Yeah. So he just basically played the outside edge of the mat. Mm hmm. Because he had points. Yeah, he let him ta he let him break his arm instead of. Tapping. It was crazy. Now yeah. for for your for your listeners out there though, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Have We're talking seen... about hardcore professional athletes that make their living fighting world championships on the line. You know, uh, thousands of dollars on the line. But in class, yeah, I I'm one of those guys that like, hey, if you catch me, mm -hmm. you trick me. Uh, you know, fighting out of an arm lock or a triangle. Look, the mistake's already been made. You got me in the trap. I made a mistake. I acknowledge it. You know, I mean, I'll fight a little bit, but, you know, as soon as I feel like, uh, nah, this is just tap and just so forget important. about it. So important to tap. The biggest mistakes I've ever made in training is not tapping. Especially when you're over 45, man. Mm -hmm. These guys that are want to. And that, that brings up another subject. Uh, I've been really doing a lot of work with jiu-jitsu for a lifetime. You know, I, I like what the grandsons of Elia Gracie have been saying. You know, well, yeah, let's get that video because you have a beautiful yeah. video that you sent me. And let's show what happened to Jacare's Ray's elbow too, by the way. Jacare yeah. had surgery on his elbow and they pulled these chunks of, of, of bone that were broken off and cartilage inside his elbow. I never heard about the aftermath. I knew it was pretty messed up, but oh. I, I never heard exactly what he had to do to repair that. Well, he did it recently. I heard it was bad, though, man. Yeah, he had it recently repaired. I mean, oh. he had it repaired back then, but the damage, all the cartilage and all the, the stuff that's broken off inside of his elbow was just swimming around in his elbow, messing Ooh, with man, his... That's some serious... Yeah, I mean, oh, it's so painful. You know, you can't extend your arm all the way. Well, your body builds up, you know, bone and calcification mm -hmm. around that injury, and you get those osteophytes, and before you know it, you pretty much lose range of motion in your your joints. Yeah, the surgery uh, images he put uh, online, and it was just like so disgusting. Bad news, man. I do love to avoid surgery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He it was a five hour surgery just to clean out his elbow. Look at this. And it's a good chance. Oh man, that is really nasty. <laughs> but you know, even after the surgery, there's a good chance it's never going to be the same again. Very good chance. Very good chance. I mean, they're finding out ways now with stem cells to regenerate cartilage, like for the first time ever. Football players are doing it. They're using it on older folk that have had bone-to-bone -bone arthritis for years. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? What's We're in happening? a great time. We're in a wow. great time. Yeah, if, you, if we could just live long enough, Joe, you know, <laughs> just get yeah. replacement parts for everything, grown from our own bodies, right? Yeah. Well, it's very possible that that is going to happen, but also very possible that they're just going to be able to regenerate tissue, that all your injured tissue, all your damaged areas are just going to be able to regenerate them. It's going to be like Star Trek, right, where they used to take that little thing and you know, mm -hmm. just go over your body and, oh, you're healed now. <laughs> well, there's a guy in Germany, uh, Dr. Peter Weller, who is the same guy who created that Regenikine process that all the pro athletes, they were flying over to Germany for doing to do it, and now they go to, uh, there's a company called Lifespan Medicine that does it in Santa Monica, and they do it in Dallas, and I, I believe they're opening up other offices as well. They take uh, your blood out. They spin it in a centrifuge and they heat it up. And the reaction to the heat makes your blood produce this really intense anti-inflammatory. And I've had it done. A lot, a lot of people have had it, really chronic injuries have had it done. And it's, it works miracles. Well, he's developed this full body MRI machine, which literally just gets a map of everything going on in your body. And once he went and did it, he developed this and found out he had colon cancer. Whoa. Yeah, he had no idea. 
okay. a particularly t aggressive type of colon cancer and caught it right away hmm. early on went into surgery now it's fine but I mean it's like this is how amazing it is it's so amazing that it actually worked and benefited the guy who created it it's amazing amazing stuff nice to be the beneficiary of your own inventions yeah. and discoveries man well, it's, it's also a reward for being on the cutting edge of healing and science for this guy, medical uh, science. But let's, let's play this uh, video that you have uh, that you sent us because it's really cool. I really uh, I liked what you're doing. It's really exciting to see, and I want to talk to you about it. So we'll play that real quick. I've spent almost a lifetime in the grappling arts. started out as a young wrestler when I was 10 years old. Always was in love with the whole concept of wrestling and grappling on the ground. Uh, it was just one of the few things I was good at right from the beginning. Jiu-Jitsu and surfing in tropical El Salvador. I love it. So for folks who are just listening and not watching, it's just Steve demonstrating a bunch of different Jiu-Jitsu techniques and uh, now mobility training, which is uh, a big part of what you do to, to keep healthy and keep your, your, your joints healthy and protect yourself from injuries, right? Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, it's hey, probably the most fun a guy, two guys can have without without a woman, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like rolling with your, you know, like wrestling on the living room floor in your pajamas with your brother, right? It's like yeah. incredibly fun, great mental stimulation. It's a fun game. Very fun game. As long as you can get over the tapping part, what, you know, what we were talking about earlier, just it's like no one gets angry when someone shoots a ball in on them on, and when you play basketball. And there's the dates there. Let's pull those dates back so we could uh, see the, what the dates are. Tell everybody where there is. Yeah, there's and 20th, this is in 22nd in March. Uh, 28th. I'm, I'm sorry, that's. Uh, of no the, uh, go, go ahead. So, oh, sorry, it says 28th of November to the 5th of December, yeah, and then the 5th of December to the 12th of December in 2015. So this is a start a new tradition, it says. This is a new thing that you're starting to do, and uh, what a great vacation. You know, have some fun, go to El Salvador, do some surfing. You guys have surf lessons. You're going to teach jujitsu, teach different ways of uh, increasing your joint flexibility and preventing injuries and just you've and got just how to stay with it for a lifetime man like yeah. for guys that want to just stick with what they love doing you wrote an article about it recently well yeah I mean like most guys by the time they hit 40 they're not gonna be doing it anymore yeah they're, they're gonna have to quit because they're going about it wrong and I was on that path myself I mean when I was in my mid-40s, I'd be getting up in the morning. It was like, oh, my God, I could barely turn around to back my car out of the garage. And I'm thinking, geez, what's, what is it going to be like in 10 years from now if I'm just in my mid-40s already suffering this pain and stiffness and inflammation? So I started really investigating the different exercise systems, mobility systems. Of course, I've always been interested in diet and, you know, experimenting and so forth. And, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. And I've... I discovered a lot of really good things I like to share with people so that you can continue to do what you love so we can all be like Master Elio Gracie and, you know, 95 years old. I mean, getting on the mat and still having fun with it. You I mean, know? He was he was fanatical about his diet, right? He was fanatical about his diet. But, you know, as you get older, you have to be. You got to you got to be more and more fanatical as, you, as, as the old aging process starts to set in when i was young i think i was just less aware of what was going on when i ate bad food i think i was just less aware like i was like oh this tastes good what a great cheeseburger it tastes awesome but i wasn't really uh, i wasn't as conscious about the actual effects whereas now i'm pretty aware of what kind of state my body's in like it's very frustrating for me if i'm if my mind is in a dull place like especially if i have to do interviews early in the morning i just haven't quite woken up yet and i'm having conversations and the words just aren't coming out that good they're just clumsy and just frustrating so i'm i'm pretty aware of like when i'm at my optimum state and i really notice now if i eat crappy food i really notice if i if, if i have like Something that's like got a lot of bread in it, or something that's just un just unhealthy, deep fried nonsense. It just well, it's two guys that do a lot of traveling. You're you know you're doing shows all over the place besides UFCs, and um, sometimes it is pretty hard, you know, to find good good stuff. But uh, what I I always pack my own stuff. I always have like a I call it my hobo bag. <laughs> 
it's a bag full of stuff I go from, you know, various health food stores or whatever. You know, I, I load up on, you know, good, really good quality stuff. Like, what do you pack in the hobo bag? Raw almonds? Yeah, I mean, there's so many paleo places around now, you know. I, I'm not like a, a, a total fanatic about paleo, but they do have some pretty damn good healthy stuff. You know, different bars and, 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 and different concoctions that um, are already sealed in f uh, pouches or, you know, di different things like that. I'll get a whole bunch of things like that. Uh, I love carob pods. Carob is just like fantastic. It's like raw carob right off the tree, and um, uh, fresh fruit. What does a what does a raw carob bar look like? Uh, it's not a bar. It's like a. It looks like uh, uh, what do they call them? The acacia pods or whatever that you see in the ground sometimes. It looks like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's sweet. You just chew it, hmm. and you spit the seeds, and it's absolutely delicious. Good fiber. Uh, it's known as a blood sugar stabilizer. So that you eat this thing, man, you're not hungry for hours. So when you're on the road, it's, it's just a good way to, you know, keep yourself from, from getting too hungry. I don't think I've ever seen it before. Um, they're very popular there it is right in there, huh? Australia. I used to get them in, uh, yeah, that's it. Wow. And very they're popular in They're Australia, delicious, huh? yeah. But uh, when, I was in, uh, when I was living um, in uh, uh, Redonda Beach area, uh, my girlfriend used to go to this place called uh, Rossum. It was like a raw foods place. And they would sell them. But my God, they were like a fucking arm and a leg, man. These things were like so crazy expensive. And one day I was in uh, Marin County. I uh, can't remember the little town. But anyway, I, I was, this is was back in my camper van days. <laughs> I go to get out and go to this little coffee shop to get a paper or whatever. And I'm seeing these things in the ground. And I look up and there's a tree. And it was like hundreds of them just laying there, man. So I got, I got some plastic baggies, you know, and just, you were sure that it was that. Well, I tasted it. Oh wow! It was like holy shit! This is this is a carob. It's a carob tree, growing right here. Pull the pull that video up again. The image rather. In Marin what does County. a carob tree look like? I don't think I've ever. I really don't think I've ever seen that. Like if I looked at that, like that one looks like a bundle of snakes. That third picture from the top. Yeah, but so, well, right there on the right, it's it's. Uh, I was just utterly shocked because, you know, I had been paying a lot of money for these damn things. Yeah. And there they were. It's just like land. <laughs> I, I had no idea that they even grew in California. How long does it last once you uh, get it from the tree? Does it go bad and rot? No, no, no. They're like dried. I mean, uh -huh. they're like a dried pod that you could just keep. For a long time? Probably years, maybe. I don't know. Wow. I mean, they're really tasty. No it's kidding. really nice little sweet. You know what? It's like, um, you know, white sugar, white granulated sugar mm -hmm. is probably one of the worst things you can eat. Toxic. Yeah, toxic, right? But sugar cane actually, you know, like from the cane field, mm -hmm. actually has a lot of health benefit. Does it really? Yeah. It's, it's sweet. It's fibrous. It has a lot of nutrients, uh, minerals, and so forth. I, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you don't eat a lot of it because it's powerful stuff. You know, it's like one of those, you know, very powerful foods. But the carob pods are kind of like the same thing. If you do have a bit of a sweet tooth or, your, you know, whatever, uh, it's a fantastic way to, to uh, sate your sweet tooth. And, wow, the fiber is amazing. Really? I really was not aware at all. I always thought of carob as like something that you... Yeah, like they, the processed stuff, yeah. like chocolate. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so It's just the, about as bad as chocolate the way they process it. Is stuff. it really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, maybe a little less harsh on your system because a lot of people have uh, chocolate sensitivities. You know, you always hear about gluten or dairy, but man, a lot of people have uh, a lot of sensitivity to chocolate. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of different things out there that have been overeaten for years and years and years that can give you food sensitivities. Well, some chocolate's really good, right? Like raw chocolate is it very can, high in antioxidants. It can be, but some people are very sensitive to the uh, acids and really? so forth than chocolate. And so there's, so, so there's carob and there's, how do you say it, cacao? Cacao. Cacao. That's the, the raw chocolate. That's the raw chocolate. And that stuff is really good for you, right? Yeah. It can be. Can be. But, but for some people, it's, it's like not. It's like it's powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you overeat anything, you're going to develop a, po a potential... Uh, uh, sensitivity. Yeah. Um, it's the, like the gluten, right? Yes, I mean, I gl gluten in itself is not all that bad, right? But Americans have been just eating it like crazy, you know? Toast in the morning, uh, you know, with a cereal. sandwich. Yeah, with cereal and then sandwich a for sandwich lunch. for lunch. And Pasta then have, for dinner. And dinner rolls. And it's just like they're getting inundated. Well, my God, you could probably develop a food sensitivity to anything. If you, probably 
you could get eggs or chicken sensitivity or something if you just ate it, you know, three three square meals a day. You know? Yeah, I'm I'm pretty certain of that. I went for a, a while, more than six months, where I just didn't touch any gluten. I said, let me see what happens. One thing, I lost weight. I was pretty um, shocked at like how easy it was. Like my body thinned out, lost body fat, my face got thinner. Um, I carry fat in my face. I'm like one of those dudes. I carry fat. If I get fat, I get love handles, and yeah, I get it in my face. Me too, man. I don't get it in my arms. I don't get it in my legs, but I get it in my like around my belly and my sides, and I get it in my face. Um, and all that went, Hurr! my face shrunk down, and my side. I was like, wow, this is interesting. It what? is interesting how the fat patterns just shrink up. Yeah. There's three major fat distributions, right? You got, you got your depot fat. That's like the love handles or with women, sometimes it's the saddlebags in the side of the thigh. Sometimes you see uh, women in the upper back or the tricep area. With guys, it's usually the, the belly. Granny arms. Yeah, or the belly or the love handles for most guys, you know. Mm -hmm. Then you have internal fat. That's the dangerous stuff. The uh, intra-abdominal fat, that gut fat, that's what, that's what can kill you. Uh, then you have subcutaneous fat. It's like the smooth fat underneath the skin, like a like an insulation layer. And then, of course, they've identified the brown fat also. It's like a active fat. It produces heat in the body. It's like part of the survival mechanism. Back when our ancestors uh, had to tolerate a lot of extremes in temperatures, like cold, you have this brown fat that's uh, like an a metabolic active fat. And uh, it's it's kids have it, but by the time you're like 12, it almost disappears because, you know, we have this uh, uh, regulated temperatures all the time. People don't expose themselves to cold. They're always bundling up and their homes are overheated. But um, what a lot of people are saying now, you can actually get that metabolically active fat, the brown fat cells going, which helps keep you lean uh, and helps burn the other yellow fat. So t cold showers, cold water treatments, uh, exposing yourself to cold, uh, real good thing for developing that and uh, the brown fat and builds your immune system and you, you have a much better tolerance to cold and much less likely to get uh, enervated in cold weather. So you don't have a tendency to come down with colds or flu and stuff like really? that. Really? Brown fat? Yeah, brown I, fat. I'd never heard of that before. Yeah. And what is it created by? Like what? It's in your, uh, it's, some of it's in the uh, peritoneal cavity, some of it's uh, up in the neck uh, area. Uh, and it's, it's just something that nature provided to help temperature regulation. Help you tolerate cold. So is that like more common with Inuits and folks who live in? Really oh yeah, for sure. They have well-developed brown fat. It's it, but you and I could do it too if we just expose ourselves a little bit more to the cold. Have you done any cryotherapy? Have you done any of that? Not as a as a, like the way it's been used. How long are you in town for? Uh, let's see. When am I? I'm going down to San Diego. I'm the keynote speaker for that uh, Strength Matter Summit. That's twentieth uh, through the twenty second. March so what's in the, San Diego, seventeenth, sixteenth, sixteenth. I got to take you to this place in L.A. Okay, it's called Cryo Healthcare. I well, got to bring you down. I there. love cold, cold. This this is insane. Two hundred and fifty degrees below zero. You go into like a meat locker. I mean, it is it is crazy. You put on a surgical mask. You put on earmuffs. You wear uh, like socks that go up to your like knee high socks and like those rubber Crocs because you don't want to stand on the floor. Yeah. And you wear also wear gloves and you wear underwear. Very important, ladies and gentlemen. And you don't want to have any moisture in your body. You don't and ever you want to go there sweaty. Just... Yeah. You wow. go there for three minutes. Okay. Three minutes at 250 degrees below zero. And it is cold as fuck. And all I do is I just concentrate on staying calm. And, and breathing. I, and I breathe and I count. And that's what I do. I go one, two, three. And I try to count slower than a minute. So that when, it, when they give you a timer, you have one minute remaining. So when I count that minute down, I always want to make sure that I'm not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm counting slower than the, the no, actual do you, do seconds. Do you build up? Do you like maybe start 30 seconds and build up each time? Or do you, you just can. go? I did. The, the, I was just curious. The first time they did it, they put me in for two minutes. And I said, how? And they go, well, the first time you want to try it. You know, don't go in too long, blah, 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 blah. And I go, okay, how, what's the longest I could do it? And they said three minutes. So I said, all right, well, I'll try your two minutes. I tried two minutes. I think, wow. I think it'll last another minute. I go, let's try another minute. So then I went in again, and I did three minutes. And now what I do is I do three minutes. I take um, maybe five, six minutes off, and I get on an elliptical machine and warm up, and then I go back in for another three minutes. Interesting. It's amazing. Well, it's amazing. for years I did the, uh, the dowsing. 
It's a ice Russian bath or? bucket treatment. Oh, ice bucket challenge. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I had been doing this years and years <laughs> before. When I lived in Philly, I had a backyard that was pretty much secluded with a big wall. So I could basically, you know, strip down naked in my backyard and my neighbors couldn't see me. And in the back corner, I had this big spigot and I had a five gallon bucket. And all year long, I would go and very slowly pour a five gallon bucket, starting with the abdomen, up over the head and down the back. And the Russians that had taught me this said that it creates like this artificial flash fever. That you know, It's not quite the same thing with the shower, which is more prolonged. Because you're dousing yourself with a sudden immersion, it's kind of like plunging into like a, a cold lake. Um, it supposedly burns up any bacteria or germs or whatever in your body. Uh, all I know is that for the years I did it in Philadelphia, 15 years, when I had, when I was a householder, I didn't get a cold. Really? I did not get a cold. People around me would have flu, they'd be sick, and I was, my immune system was like uh, uh, amazing. Well, the benefits of this cryotherapy, as uh, it's been explained to me, and if you go to cryohealthcare.com, I think it is, I forget the website, but the, the, the name of the place in L.A. is Cryo Healthcare. There's, t there's a bunch of different styles of these cryo machines. One of them is from the neck down. You stand in and your head is outside and you don't have to put anything on your face. I don't find that one to be as effective. It's good. It's certainly better than nothing. Um, but the one we step into the meat locker, God, that's a motherfucker. They're going to have one of those down the street in Woodland Hills, wow. um, down the road a bit. Uh, they're going to be uh, putting up one of those within the next month or so. Well, that would certainly stimulate brown fat growth, oh, I would think. So yeah, this is this is the see the meat locker one is the one on the left. See they they have that one. That one's fairly common, kind of nationwide. That one, the one that you see on the left, the meat locker. That's the motherfucker. I like that one, man. Ooh, I'm going to take you. There. It's actually so claustrophobic in that one, right? No, now, it's not claustrophobic. You, you the, can the, open the, the little, door the, easy. Yeah, the little one just looks like Ugh, I don't know, man. The no, little, the little one's easy. The little one's so easy. It's not, it's not, the little one's hard if you've never done it before. You go, oh, Jesus. But if you've done it, um, the, the big one is like the, the little one, that's that one right there. You yeah. just kind of, you climb out of it, you're fine. But the, uh, the big one has this amazing effect. You get out of there, you feel like you could jump over buildings. You're like, whoa! Once your body, like, realizes that you're not going to die, no one has dropped you on the top of the moon, and it's on a hundred, really 250 degrees below zero. That's literally the surface of the moon is 250 degrees below zero. No kidding. Yeah, in the dark. Wow. The, the moon varies from, like, 250 degrees to 250 degrees below zero, depending on whether or not the sun is hitting you or whether or not you're in the shade. Well, that's, like, how all these things work, even, even training, right? You know, your body, if, if training's done properly, your body perceives it as a threat to its survival. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you basically yeah. are tapping into your survival mechanism with these things. Yes. And your body and its wisdom will say, hey, I'm not quite up to snuff here. I better adapt and get stronger so I don't die. Yeah. And that, that's training too, weight training or, or anything. You know, you, you have to make it uh, stimulating enough and difficult enough to tap into that survival mechanism. So that if you're not, you're not getting the benefit of the, the training or, in this case, the, the cryotherapy. So your body, you know, like an adaptation response. Well, there's this new uh, system that they're, they've developed in Japan. It's called Katsu. And uh, I, I don't know the gentleman's name who created it, but I had a chance to try it out this weekend in Austin. And what it essentially is is like these... They, they take these straps and they constrict the outs like your your bicep like right below the uh, the delts and um, then you go through like a 15 minute routine like 15 minutes of you do curls you start off you do push-ups you do curls with a kettlebell to failure and all this is while your blood flow is restricted and then you do like uh, ropes and you do sets of three for 15 minutes and by the end of the 15 minutes your fucking arms are dead i mean dead because yeah, you're restricting the blood flow and then they release it and take it off and apparently the response that your body has to the fact that your blood flow is restricted it triggers all sorts of of responses as far as your growth hormone your testosterone all these different your, your body starts trying to compensate for the fact that it doesn't have enough blood flow so it just over ramps everything up and it's apparently fantastic for healing it's fantastic mm -hmm. for people that have injuries recovery time from injuries reduces drastically like uh bodie miller the uh the olympic skier 
Um, he uh, used it to get back in shape from uh, surgery, like much quicker than he would have without it. It's just one more, one of these new methods, much like this cryo thing, much like many of these other protocols, where they're trying to figure out ways to kind of trick your body into ramping up the healing process or ramping up the. So it's used for healing, not for strength training per se. For both. Okay. For both. I'd for, just be curious. It'd be interesting to see how it compares to this traditional strength training as far as, you know, actual general strain. Yeah, and the idea also is that it puts a, a strong load on your muscles, but not on your joints. Because everything you're doing, like say if you're doing like kettlebell uh, curls to failure, I was doing it with like a 35-pound kettlebell with two hands. That's not a lot of weight, you no. know? It's not a lot of weight. And just you're just cranking out reps. But because your biceps are tied so off at the pumping, top. You're just getting that blood crazy all pumped. pumped and trapped up in, into the into the muscles. Yeah, your arms. Because the just, flow is restricted. I get it. Yeah, they grow dry. They look giant. Like, your arms it are sounds giant. Sounds painful, man. Yeah, it's painful. It's painful. But I just fucked around with it yesterday for the first time. And apparently the results are amazing. And uh, at on it, we're starting to look into this and trying to, you know, see what we could do with it to bring this uh, to the mainstream. But to try to get uh, more athletes involved in doing things like this, you kind of get these, you get these results where you, you start going, oh, okay, well, if you do that and this, what if you do cryotherapy and this Katsu method and also the breathing, also the like, what are, what are the what's the the difference in the response to your body? Like, what's the difference in how quickly you can heal, how quickly you can get in shape? Um, and that's a big issue for MMA fighters is the downtime from injury and then ramping your body back up to competition shape afterwards. We, you could tell. I mean, anybody who's ever gotten to a very good fitness level and then got injured, it's so frustrating getting back to the gym and then trying to get back in shape. You and, realize, and a lot of guys never, never do get back because it's just such a hard road, uh, such a hard road to, to uh, come back on. It's hard for people to accept the state that they're in. You know, like especially uh, that's one of the issues with younger athletes. You know, you're young, you're 20, your body heals quick, you're just a wild motherfucker, and you're, you're doing anything you want, you're reckless. And as you get older, it's one of the things that I liked about your article that you wrote, you have to be smarter. You have to be smarter. You have to recognize that your body is going to take longer to heal. You can't be reckless with it. And also, you really should, probably shouldn't have been reckless with it when you were 20, but you could, you could get away with it to a certain extent. Now that you're older, you have to be wiser. Well, you, you know, everyone thinks they're bulletproof and they're going to last forever. You know, you mm -hmm. just... Can't even imagine. I, I can remember going to a wrestling tournament. It was in York, Pennsylvania. It was like I used to do the summer wrestling, freestyle wrestling circuit. They used to have tournaments all over the, Pennsylvania. And I remember meeting a guy that was like 33 years old. And I was just blown away. My God, you're still wrestling. You're 33. Oh, man, you're my new hero. I can't believe it. I want to be just like you when I'm 30. <laughs> I, I just couldn't believe it. I thought this guy was like ancient. You know, I was probably like 19 at the time, you know. <laughs> I could not believe that this guy was in there wrestling as well as he did at 33. And isn't that funny now? You would kill, do anything to I have a 33-year-old body. Dude, man, 42-year-old, <laughs> I was like still fantastic, you know, still feeling great. But, uh, yeah, I mean, as my grandfather said, no one gets out of here alive. You know, <laughs> You're, you know uh, father time will take its toll over time no matter what you do no matter how many therapies and so forth you know but you try to do your best with what you got and you do try to preserve your youth and your vitality but one one of the major problems i see especially in extremist sports like jiu-jitsu or mma or whatever uh, is the overtraining mm -hmm. everyone thinks more is better and it's not better is better but more is not better that's and, a huge issue with wrestling oh terrible wrestlers may are notoriously the most overtrained group of athletes there there are, I think. But isn't that training with the overtraining, doesn't that develop this insane mental toughness that wrestlers are known for? Well, that's part of it. The, the mental toughness is, is is a huge part of it because that is a hard-ass sport. Did you happen to see the uh, the uh, 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 Foxcatcher, the movie? Yes, I did. That uh, it wasn't exactly accurate. But At all. No. Mark Schultz put up actually a thing on his Facebook page, all the inaccuracies okay. that are in that movie, and they're pretty substantial. Pretty substantial. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's actually frustrating and annoying. The guy's alive, he's an Olympic gold medalist, a world champion, one of the best wrestlers really pretty much ever. Ever. And they, they portrayed him in a very inaccurate light. Pretty much so. Yeah, I mean, they made him look like a dumb jock. 
The guy's brilliant. The guy was brilliant and uh, very articulate, very smart guy. And uh, my college wrestling coach was the junior coach there, Fox Schedule. Ooh. Yeah, Dale Bonzel. He's in the college. Uh, so he was there when he's, all that was He's going the on. NCAA uh, Coaches Hall of Fame. Uh, so this was after you were in college. Obviously. This is after this I had graduated in from the college. 90s, right? I was still living in Philly. And, you know, Dale used to invite me to come on down and uh, train now and again. And I, I, I took him up on it a couple of times. Unfortunately, it was just a little bit too far away to be driving. You know, I had a day job. Wrestling is one of those sports that uh, you pretty much have to have your mid-afternoons open because that's when all the universities train and that's when most guys train. So I was really, you know, Jones for some grappling experience, but it was really hard working a job. And at that time I was married and a householder with a family and all that. But I did go down a few times and I got a chance to tour the facility and it was really impressive. And uh, had a clinic with, um, well, the guy they didn't even mention was that guy, uh, Valentin Jordan, the uh, Bulgarian guy. That's the guy that uh, DuPont uh, gave his whole fortune to. When he died, his fortune went to the uh, this Bulgarian uh, coach. Really? Was that yeah, yeah. The, the family's still fighting it. They're still contesting it to this day. Wow. Yeah, yeah. He really liked this guy. And so I had uh, I had a couple clinics with that guy, one at Drexel, and because uh, he you know he's making his way around the different colleges, and learned a lot of awesome exercises and conditioning and wrestling, and of course I met the great Dave Schultz, had a clinic with him. It's like wow, he was definitely one of America's finest wrestlers ever, but even more than his physical skills was his his mental skills. He he just had an amazing mind, and I was really fortunate to have you know been able to travel in those type of circles and get a chance to see it but this is after my my uh college wrestling days so i was looking for that thing to fill the gap you know mm -hmm. and that's when i discovered those crazy brothers in, you know around 1989 man it was like oh shit this is what i've been looking for man what is it about the bulgarians and a lot of the russians and you know you, there's a lot of those pe people from that part of the world that are such good athletes there's so many tough people from that part of the world like what is that well you know a lot of our best fighters come from you know the poorer sections of America, you know? Mm -hmm. Kids come up in the projects and, you know, some of these inner city kids, you know? You know, like, look at, uh, like, in Philly or Detroit or, man, you get some tough kids mm. that grow up scrapping. And it builds a mental toughness sometimes, you know? Like uh, Mike Tyson uh, growing up where, where he did in uh, Hell's Kitchen up there in New York. I mean, or Brownsville, actually. Or yeah. Brownsville, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, those, those guys are just, you know, they, they grow up in a really tough neighborhood, kind of like dog eat dog, and it produces like a really tough kind of minded person. And I think a lot of these Eastern European countries, you know, they don't have much, and you know, they 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 they, um, they have a lot of time in their hands. There's not a lot to do for the kids, and you know, they end up like most boys, you know, getting into trouble and fighting and doing all this kind of crazy stuff. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, this new urban playground gymnastics kind of stuff that the guys are doing has become so popular because, I mean, you know, that's pretty available. It's just equipment just sitting there. It costs very little to put it in. Did we play that video of you there last time we were here? Yeah, with the, uh, with the, with the bar stars. Play, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, that was pretty cool, man. But in Eastern Europe, that stuff's really popular, you know? And um, so, so, yeah, they don't have a lot to do. They don't have the, the same kind of um, basketball courts that we do and they they don't have the facilities a lot of times, but wrestling is pretty cheap, man. You know, it doesn't take a lot of equipment. Right. It's and not, anybody not just can wrestling. Do it. Really, there's a lot of boxers right now that yeah, are coming out of that boxers. part of the world as well. Sure. I mean, uh, Sergey Kov Kovalev. Have you seen him fight before? I have, guy? Not, I have not. I, I've heard the name, but I, I haven't had the opportunity to actually see him. Oh, he's a motherfucker, man. Yeah. He beat Bernard Hopkins, and then he just beat uh, Jean Pascal the other night. And man, it's amazing. It Such is amazing. a good fighter. The way he moves. I mean, he really makes boxing exciting again. He's a killer. Just goes for the kill, like constantly, but super technical. Like everything about his movement is very technical. His footwork, his his distancing, the economy of his movements, the way he throws punches, just beautiful, beautiful to watch. But there's so many tough guys. Gennady tough. Golovkin, all these tough, tough guys coming out of, of Russia, of that area, you know, that part of the world, the so former Soviet Union. Well, I've traveled, like, into Siberia. I've, I, I traveled to, like, uh, uh, you know, 
down around the Black Sea area. I've been to a lot of the Slavic countries too, you know, Serbia and Slovenia. And man, the guys are huge, big, strapping guys. And you just don't see the obesity either, man. Right. They, they don't have the food to just, you know, they, they can't afford just to overeat like we do in America or, you know, in uh, the rest of Europe or the UK or whatever. Uh, you see some, you know, some real fatties. But man, when you're there, wow, people are pretty, pretty lean and wiry and stringy. And a lot of the younger guys are just like specimens. I don't know whether it's genetics or... It has to be. I mean, you think about the people that have lived and gotten through those harsh climates and tough jobs and just had to work Survival of the fittest. Yeah. Man. And that's those are the people that bred and those are the people that kept going. What you, what you notice also about a lot of those people from that part of the world, which is interesting enough, is not just that they're tough, but that they're very technical. There's a lot of really technical wrestling that comes out of Russia and uh, out of uh, the former Soviet Union, that area. Like... Those guys, um, those Russian nationals that went up to Montreal, that's a lot of where George St. Pierre learned how to wrestle. Never wrestled in high school, never wrestled in college, but became one of the best wrestlers in MMA, and that's part of the reason why. I remember I wrestled, uh, back, this is in the 70s, I wrestled in the Montreal Open Wrestling Tournament. And this is just a, at that time when the Russians were making a big influx and you know they were starting to... Uh, try to uh, defect and, and, and flee to the Western world. It was the Soviet Union still existed. And I remember I wrestled Victor Silberman in the finals and got my ass handed to me, man. And so I was trying to talk to him later because I was really impressed with this guy's technique and his skill and everything. And uh, I, I was utterly shocked when he told me that he only lifted weights once a week. He lifted weights four times a month. And I thought, how is that even possible? I thought these Russian guys, like, lifted weights every day, twice right. a day. Yeah. And he says, no, 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 no. We, we practice technical wrestling as the base of our training. And then I was utterly shocked. Um, I had a, a guy that uh, was training with me in Philly for a while. He's a five-time Ukrainian national wrestling champion. He used to be on the, the national team. This was back when the Ukraine and Russia was all part of the Soviet Union. And he was telling me that um, they would only spar really hardly like, twice a week because they found that the Live wrestling was what was producing all the injuries. But when they would train, they would train like real slow motion, and they would gradually build their speed to the point where they were just going all out hard. And they would just do this for long periods of time. And wow, it is unbelievably hard workout when you're shooting high crotch singles, doubles, and so forth at match speed over and over and over and over. It's like, holy shit. And that was their main cardio. It takes real discipline to do it that, though. It takes discipline, man. Most people, that's in jiu-jitsu as well, it's very similar. A lot of very guys similar. just want to roll. Just want to roll. They don't want to go over drills. But they never get technical. That's the yeah, problem. That is the problem. Yeah, drills are where you really learn how to have those movements become a part of your nervous system. Where become, just, and then, you know, and, and, and keeping the sparring limited, uh, you, you don't get your muscles and joints as stressed, and you don't get the injuries. But I was very surprised to hear that. Uh, you know, because I had a complete different uh, perception. Because in American wrestling, you just basically pound each other every time you go into the wrestling room. You know, it's just, you know. Yeah, that is the problem with the... Uh, do, do, do Americans Russians... produce amazingly tough wrestlers. Of course. Well, we but, the about... the, but the reason why, I think why we're not seeing uh, Americans dominating the international scene anymore is like there's no damn money in it, man. You know, you, you graduate from college and, you know, maybe you have a degree or whatever. But what are you going to do with your wrestling skills? MMA. Yeah. The UFC opened up a whole new, you know, a whole new door for former NCAA wrestlers. Why the hell would you go and go to the Olympics and make peanuts when you can make fairly decent money, possibly, if you're good, you know, if you're a tough guy? Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Do the Russians have that same issue with overtraining? Do, do the... No, no, because they don't spar uh, uh, as much as the Americans do. They, they, they're very careful not to overtrain. They, you know, they, they, they have like blocks where they, they kind of, you know, they kind of amp, ramp up the training as they get nearer and nearer like world championships or the Olympics or whatever. Some people call it periodization or whatever, but they, they're very careful not to, you know, overtrain and over overdo it. 
Well, how come? Well, they're known for their mental toughness as well. Like, wh why does uh, why don't the American wrestlers incorporate that into their workouts, or have they started? Well, to do I think that? they probably are. You know, I've lost a little bit of touch with the wrestling community, but you know, our wrestling coaches are fantastic. You know, they're smart guys, so I'm sure they're taking a hard look because the Russians have been really successful, as have the Iranians, as the Turks, the Bulgarians. You know, all these countries that perennially put out like world champions, Azerbaijan. You know. Uh, the Mongolians are really starting to dominate uh, judo, and they, you know they've always been tough as shit in wrestling. So, I think that uh, for sure, you can learn a lot from their their basic programs. They're pretty simple programs, really. They're, 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 they don't have a lot of sophisticated equipment and so forth. But what they ma they make up they make up for a lack of uh, in sophistication with equipment and facilities and all that with technique. They're real technicians. That is the most important part of any martial art. The most important part is having that technique down to just a razor sharpness. A razor sharpness, man. You got to hone those skills because, you know, uh, MMA, jiu jitsu, judo, wrestling, it's all technique. I really wish you had watched this uh, past weekend, this UFC, because, uh, man. Yeah, I'm going to have to catch you on the replay now. You got to watch Anthony Pettis versus Rafael Dos Anjos. That must have been a hell of a match. Ooh, Dos Anjos. Beat the brakes off of Pettis. Is it up in the internet yet? I don't Have they loaded so. it? Okay. I don't how, so. how long did they wait to, before they were uh, loaded up? I mean, and what site do you go to? Do, do uh, fight um, fight pass UFC yeah. fight pass? Yeah. It's I don't know. I don't believe it's up yet. Okay. And I'll check. I don't. I don't think it is. I mean, I know it's on pay per view. It might be available on fight pass. Okay. Yeah. I, I was just I'll, curious how long, but I'll, I'll go. I'll definitely give it a check. Fight pass has pretty much everything, um, but I don't know how. I think they do show some pay-per-views. They yeah. have live events. Hey, why, why, don't you, why don't you bring the clip up? I'm going to run the men's okay. real quick. I'll be right back in just one second. Go ahead. I'll try to find it. We'll see if we can find some highlights of it. But uh, what I'm going to ask Steve about it after he gets done using the little girl's room. Um, I, what was incredibly impressive was not just the skill level that Dos Andro showed, but the, the pace and the fitness. And Steve... Uh, he doesn't want to toot his own horn, so I'll toot it while he's out of the room. He's like he's so knowledgeable, and he got Diego Sanchez into probably the best shape of his life when Diego uh, challenged BJ Penn for the belt, and uh, Diego wound up uh, getting beaten pretty badly by BJ when BJ was in his prime. BJ's like an all-time great, and uh, just uh, one of my all-time favorite fighters. But he was in incredible shape for this fight as well, which was always like kind of his Achilles heel was his uh, he was so talented, but he just did never really uh, was able to continue that sort of strength and conditioning program that got him into the shape that he was when he fought Diego Sanchez. And what we were talking about with Steve uh, being that the technique is so important. It is so incredibly important, but MMA is so unbelievably grueling. You know, I had a conversation with Chael Sonnen about it, who's a former UFC fighter and has fought for the title several times, a great fighter, and a, also a very open g guy, very open as far as like his own limitations and uh, his strengths and weaknesses. And he was just talking about how the time that you spend inside the octagon, the, the, the competing for 25 minutes, is almost impossible to really do. It's almost too much time. Um, what I was saying was that Steve's back. What I was saying that the amount of time that you spend in the octagon fighting in a championship fight is so insane. Like tw it's almost like you're sprinting for 25 minutes. It's brutal. And very few people uh, figure out how to get in the right shape as well as work their skills. And there's that it's weird. It's so hard, man, because like endurance is a skill. But then there's also the skill of making the other guy use up his energy more than yourself. Mm. And, I mean, that energy, you know, uh, controlling and, and, and managing your energy system in the ring and on the mat is such a skill unto itself. I mean, not, let's just take out the striking skills and the grappling skills and all that stuff. Just that energy management, that's huge, man. And a lot of guys don't pay enough attention to that. I think. Well, dealing with pressure 
is a, a big one. I, I remember from my my days of competing that when guys were like really aggressive and I was backing up a lot, trying to move away, I'd get so much more tired because you're always thinking. You're think you're dealing with this guy attacking you and you're backing up, which is a kind of an unnatural movement. I mean, a lot of people run, but very few people run backwards. And you got to realize that when you're going backwards, you're kind of using your muscles in a different way. Way you're, different. Yeah. Exhausting, and, man. Yeah, and very few people do that. Like Muhammad Ali used to run miles backwards because he was always backing up and then moving forward, backing up and moving forward. And one of the most beautiful things about him when you watch him, like in his prime, like the Cleveland Big Cat Williams days before uh, they took his title away because he didn't want to fight in the Vietnam War, his footwork and movement was just magical. And his ability to back up, I mean, you, you really couldn't catch him. He was just backing up and moving forward, backing up and moving forward. And that's something he had to work at really hard. But three minutes in a boxing match is so much different, different. than five minutes with wrestling and leg kicks and elbows and the clench. And God, it's one of the... So, I'm, I'm curious to see what you think after you watch this fight, because one of the most impressive things about the fight, as far as Dos Anjos' performance, was his cardio was insane. Yeah, it was some insane. Of guys are just like something else, man. I mean, he just attacked from the moment the the fight started. He just went after Pettis, and uh, just never let up. Like literally, never went up. Let up. It was amazing. It really was amazing. Here's a, here's a maybe a sore point, uh, but what do you think? about the the use of the uh, performance enhancing like stimulants to like mask what? fatigue and so forth like which kinds you can oh, do I, I know, know. there's Caffeine's so legal. many different ones these days i'm just curious are they testing for this stuff now uh you know are the are these guys using like uh, uh, various uh, stimulants to keep them like really uh, pretty much hopped up well, they're testing for everything. Everything. Okay. So guys are getting popped for a lot of different stuff. Okay. Like Hector Lombard. This, got... is, this is strict testing now? Oh, I mean, yeah, okay. yeah. Especially okay. California. I mean, I've given this guy credit, but I'm going to give him credit again. Andy Foster's uh, been the director of the California State Athletic Commission for a few, I think a couple of years now. But um, he's a former fighter, a longtime martial artist, and he's very smart, very diligent about this. And I've had some, I had a conversation with him uh, when the UFC was in Los Angeles and, uh, one of the things that he said, uh, he goes, first of all, we're going to test everybody tonight. We're not just testing the, the guys in the main event. We're not just testing the, you know, the, the people that are involved in the pay-per-view. We're testing everyone that competes tonight, blood and urine. Wow. Urine before the fight, blood after the Fantastic. fight. Fantastic. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. It's so huge. I wish they'd do that for uh, regular jiu-jitsu, although it's probably cost prohibitive. You it's know? very cost prohibitive. It's like $40,000. I mean, depending on what lab you go to, I'm sure the results vary or the, the price varies. But the, well, at least what, the place winners, you know, the first... Uh, yeah, Anyone sure. on the podium needs to have be tested, man. Yeah, for jiu-jitsu, I agree. Well, jiu-jitsu does have a real epidemic in it. It's a it's a real issue. And unfortunately, a lot of jiu-jitsu guys that have come over to MMA have pissed hot, too. Yeah. Um, but it's because strength is so... It's such a critical factor in, in forcing positions. You know, I mean, technique is everything, for sure, but... Strength and endurance, man. It's goddamn huge. And there's some guys, we all know, some guys you try to hit... Uh, singles on them you try to like try to do an arm drag and it's like trying to pull a wall like you know, a you, wall you know, some dudes like look at Husamar Palhares is a perfect example that damn dude is so strong he's so ridiculously strong do you see guys like John Fitch tangle up with him I mean John Fitch is an elite wrestler elite took him down and cranked on his leg in the first round I mean John never got out of the round he just couldn't couldn't get out of the round all of a sudden he's leg locked and just didn't know what to do and got his got his leg hyperextended but these um, uh, performance-enhancing drugs they're catching guys for, some of them I've never even heard of. Oh, they're getting so sophisticated yeah. and stuff now. There's so many new cocktails mm -hmm. that fall kind of just within the you know, borders of legality, you know? Well, because that's what... people are always discovering some new way to hop up or... You know, I, yeah. I, mean, I was just curious what your take, you know, because you're around these guys all the time. So, well, I think there's a lot of guys that are taking things um, when they don't think they're going to get tested. You know, when they they need to recover well, just for the training and all, yeah. just to get through the yeah the the training and also to recover from injuries. That's a big one, and not just injuries that you know about like surgeries, but almost everybody's tweaked. You got a, a bum knee, or your elbow's bothering you, or something's going on with your neck. Everybody, there's no, almost no yeah. way of avoiding yeah. it. No, yeah, exactly. You cannot engage in an extremist sport like MMA 
and maybe to a lesser extent, jiu-jitsu and, and judo and wrestling at that competitive level without the tweaks. Yeah, I don't it, think it's there's It's virtually a way. impossible. You cannot do a combat sport without paying the price to the, to the body. But I wonder if... A protocol will eventually be established, like the most intelligent protocol, similar to what you're getting with these Russians that are uh, that, that are developing. That they've developed this program for wrestling, where they're just doing a lot of technical training, not nearly as much sparring, but a lot of technique, a lot of repetition and drills. I wonder if that will slowly work its way into MMA and be established as this is the way to do it. The way they're doing it, say, in Russia. Yeah, well, I, I think it's going to have to at some point because, you know, the career window for a lot of these guys right now is like, what would you say, like two years maybe? Well, Three? nine years seems to be the magic number for everybody. That's, that's like, the limit, right? Yeah. But don't you see a lot of these guys pretty much burning out within about uh, two and a half, three years? It seems like there's a lot of guys that, you know, flare to the top and then they're they're gone. Yeah, there's also the issue where they're, they're kind of forced to keep competing on a regular basis once they become successful, especially you break into the top 10 and you want to keep competing and winning. And so you win a big fight and say, okay, we're, the UFC calls you up on Monday. Hey, we got blah, blah, blah in four months. You're like, fuck, okay. And you think, you know, man, I would really love to rest this knee. I'd really love to, you know, uh, get some therapy on, you know, this elbow or whatever whatever issues you have. And oftentimes that's not an option. They have to go right back into training camp, and these injuries become chronic. It's a brutal way to make a living, man. It's a very brutal way to make a living. And some guys, I don't know how Randy Couture did it. I don't know either. He got through into his late 40s with no surgeries. Of course, he was an anomaly. Uh, he, yeah. I mean, he was like, uh, I mean, one out of thousands and thousands. You know, you just don't find guys like him. Yeah, I don't know how the hell he did it. I mean, I really have no idea. It's it's incredible. I wonder if he's suffering now at all. Do you know him personally? I do know him personally, but he seems fine. Is he? Yeah, he seems no, fine. No uh, dementia or anything. From Doesn't the, seem. No, he was just interviewed recently. Um, he uh, was. <laughs> Walking down the street with a girl who looked like she's about 20 years old. Wow. And he's got to be about 50. Okay. And uh, she looked like uh, like she just hopped off a porn set, put on a T-shirt, and uh, strutting down the road with Captain America. <laughs> wow, man. As as my Australian <laughs> friends would say, good on you, mate. Yeah, good on you, mate. So, yeah. Yeah. He, um, I mean, he seems fine. But well, the, the point being that they asked him questions about Layla Ali. Uh, you know, Layla Ali's you know, saying that she wants to fight Ronda Rousey. Oh, right. I was. And, uh, I heard that little flap a doodle about that uh, stuff. Yeah, but I think uh, that's just... Because, uh, you know, like one of, my, one of my heroes was, of course, the great Dan Gable. Mm. Probably one of the greatest yeah. wrestlers, not just in America, but the t world has ever produced, man. He was amazing. I mean, he went through the... The uh, Munich Olympics, what year was it? That was like 72, was it? Munich Olympics? Or was that 76. Montreal? 76. What was 76 was Where America. Was, Munich? was that Los Angeles to 76 or was that 88? I don't remember. It was the Munich Olympics. It was that year that was they, Seoul, right? where they had that tragic oh, with the, uh, right, 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 right. With the, uh, the terrorists. Right. But anyway, he walked through that tournament unscored on. Yeah. How is that even possible at the elite level not to be scored on? Incredible. Jesus it's like, wow. I don't think anyone's ever done it before or since. No, he was an uber dedicated Just monster. Just a different man. guy, man. But, but wow, double hip replacement. I don't know whether he's had knee replacement, but I saw a video of the poor guy, man. I mean, I, I suppose if you'd ask him, was it worth it? He'd probably say, hell yeah, you know, the glory. But I. His he, mind is fine. At he least. just looks like he's in such utter pain the way he shuffles and, and, and moves around. He just beat himself to death, basically, with those crazy marathon training. And that's one of the problems with a lot of the young guys. He was the role model for a lot of us young guys coming up. And, you know, that, that approach, that kamikaze approach to training, it really ages the body. Yeah, it really does. And when you're in your 20s, you're not seeing the big picture, man. You know, you got to live with that body for, you know, a good number of years after you hang up your wrestling shoes. Yeah, and I think what you said, like if you asked him, he probably would say it was worth it because he, you can't take away history. I mean, that guy has amazing memories of being one of the greatest wrestlers greatest of wrestlers all time. Ever. But 
his mind is okay at least. Yeah, he's a very intelligent guy. Yeah, but and he doesn't uh, have dementia or anything. That no, you've seen no. With these well, at least in wrestling, you're not taking that uh, the uh, the brain trauma. Yeah, Mark Coleman, uh, first ever UFC heavyweight champion, his body is uh, starting to fail him. He had one hip replacement, and apparently they have to replace it again. He had a massive infection when they went in to look at it, and he's in the hospital now. And there's a GoFundMe. Uh, I'll, I'll retweet the link uh, later today after this podcast is over for folks who want to help out Mark. But uh, he, um, you know, his, his body is just all banged up from the years of wrestling, yeah. high-level wrestler. And then from there, uh, all the years of competing in MMA, he's, he's getting his hip replaced, too. He's, uh, I believe both of them need to be replaced. So that brings us back then full circle to where we started with the uh, you know, jiu-jitsu for, for a lifetime. I really do believe there is a way that you can train and have a lot of fun with this stuff. But you got to keep it really light, you know, like the, like, uh, the, the grandsons of L.A. Gracie. Keep it playful. Keep it fun. Mm -hmm. Don't be so concerned about points. I mean, some guys will bleed from the eyes not to have their guard passed. It's like, dude, it's right. like not even a tournament. You're getting cranked up on your neck and, and, yeah. and, and, and you're taking all this abuse for what? Right. You know? Let your guard be passed and then yeah. work on reclaiming, reclaiming yeah. guard. Yeah, and just you know? get good at defense like uh, like uh, Master Elio. You know, mm. He was a master at defense, man. You couldn't do anything to the old man. And that's one of the things that Hickson always preaches. Like defense is the most important thing. The most yeah. important thing is defense. Be safe. Be You're safe. Always safe. And, and you, I think you can extend your grappling career well into advanced age. I, I think of all the martial arts, you can pretty much do jujitsu and – Submission wrestling, if you're if you're smart, well into advanced age, unlike a lot of other things. Well, it's ironic that you say that because Hickson himself is very banged up, like really badly banged up. He has eight herniated discs. His uh, he's got a lot of muscle atrophy. Like if you look at his body, he's got a lot of a lot of pain and suffering. And uh, he talked about it pretty openly when he was on the podcast. And then afterwards, we discussed it. I mean, he doesn't look physically anything like he looked like back when he fought yeah, Takata. He or any quite, was... quite a specimen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. He was 200-plus pounds, very thick-muscled and just flexible. And his movement was amazing. But all those years of getting cranked and, cranked and also and constantly training, constantly in there, constantly rolling. And being slammed a lot, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's you take, a big one. I mean, you can see in some of the old uh, videos mm -hmm. where he's getting smashed down to the ground pretty hard. Mm -hmm. That Zulu fight, you know, yeah. he's basically throwing himself backwards on top of him. I mean, that's a big, heavy guy. And I mean, that wasn't just that. It, it, it's, like you said, it, it's the training mm -hmm. for that stuff. Yeah, it's ironic when you think about him being one of the masters and one of the, the the real originators of that whole breathing system. You know, he brought that yogic breathing, that fire breathing, to uh, to the practice of jujitsu. And here he's all just really banged up. He really can't train anymore. I mean, he kind of like goes over technique, and I think maybe he does some really really light rolling with people he knows, p perhaps. But well, it happens to everyone eventually. Yeah. You know, I'm very picky myself now. I'm in my 60s. It's like... Uh, but Hickson's 10 years younger than you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And probably the consensus, all-time great. All-time great. Yeah, if you ask people, like, who's the best jiu-jitsu... And, you know, he he's a guy that tapped Mark Schultz. I asked him about that on the podcast. Uh, him and Mark Schultz, like, Mark Schultz had never really rolled with a jiu-jitsu black belt before. And he said the guy was an incredible grappler, incredible grappler. But... Hickson caught him like in like 30 seconds with a triangle. Like he just had no idea what it was. You know, he really didn't know what he was doing. As most wrestlers. Yeah. <laughs> and especially at the time. But, uh, most wrestlers now, give I would like, imagine. Give him like six months, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that Mark was um, disqualified for in one of his key matches was he uh, got a guy in a Kimura and used it to, uh, used it in a way that's illegal in wrestling. And you would use it all the time like that in MMA, but he locked it up and rolled the guy with it and just ripped his shoulder apart. Ouch. I think the guy was from Turkey. Um, pull, pull up the video. See, Mark Schultz disqualified wrestling, but it's a classic uh, double wrist lock. You know, yeah. catch wrestling, double wrist catch lock. Catch wrestling. And he uses it to flip the guy over and just destroys his arm in the process. And he went on to learn a lot of uh, submission techniques. Oh, the and, guy was an absolute frightening animal 
towards the yeah. end, wasn't he? After yeah. he learned those submissions. Well, he's so physically strong, too. And, and a lot of the early catches, catch can wrestling, submissions were all part of it. Mm -hmm. I'm reading this fascinating book. Let me get the exact title here. I'm, uh, right now, one of the, it's the history of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and this guy did an amazing job on, on putting this uh, putting this uh, thing together. I don't know. I don't have it here. I think it's called... Uh, so he's yeah, the thing. He gets... The guy's trying to get a single, so he's got his legs in between... Um, he's got Schultz's leg in between his legs. Schultz locks up the double wrist lock and drops and rolls and just destroys his arm. Just destroys it. It's really interesting, but I I saw Kimura on one of those old black and white pre World War Two judo videos do the same exact mm -hmm. takedown with with the gi. Oh yeah, he locked up the Kimura the same exact way and and threw the guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me see that one more time. I love watching that. That's Maybe. absolutely brutal, isn't it? Yeah, he was disqualified for that. Yeah, I believe so. Pretty sure. Watch how he does this crank. Ah, I mean, that is just. That, my shoulder's gone, dude. Oh, oh yeah. Look at the guy. You can just see the guy. Like, he just oh. collapsed in agony. Ow. That's uh, very similar to when uh, Frank Mir broke Minotauro's arm. Yes. Yeah. I remember that match. Yeah, that was like. Didn't whoa. want to tap. And Henzo got his arm broken mm -hmm. by Sakuraba. And, yeah. And, yeah, uh, Sakuraba. It was almost the same type of situation where it was a Stanley Kimura and he was trying to throw him. And I think Henzo resisted by straight in the arm, but it was enough torque that it, um, it it popped. I believe Henzo had his back and just got a little relaxed because I think Henzo was winning the fight. Henzo had Sakuraba's back. And, you know, Sakuraba, when you had his back, that's when he would lock that up. And he said, uh, Henzo talked about it recently. He said he was really surprised at how strong Sakuraba was. Oh, he's a strong little dude, man. Because he had been rolling and, or fighting, rather, with much larger guys. Like he fought Conan Silveira in the first UFC when he fought in Japan. And it was a 98 maybe, and he was, you know, 190-something, and Conan is like 250. And uh, he tapped him with an arm bar, if you remember that. And it was like one of the first times we ever saw a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt get tapped. We were like, whoa, I know, it's this shocking, is crazy. That was the introduction of the world to Sakuraba. Well, you know, it's funny. When I was a kid, uh, York Barbell was like the mecca for strength training in those days. And Bob Hoffman, the father of American weightlifting and weight training, he had this system called the heavy light system where you would u use heavy weights one, uh, during one session and then lighter weights the next. But the lighter weights weren't that light. They just felt light because you had used heavy weights before. And sometimes even in the same session, you would hold a really heavy weight. And then when you go to your normal weight, it felt ridiculously light. Hmm. Right? It, I used to do that in wrestling. I called it my heavy light system. And I would spar with all the heavy weights uh, on our team, all the big boys. And then when I went with guys in my own weight, they felt like toys. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, the heavy light system. And I, I've, I've talked to a lot of guys that uh, had experience wrestling with big guys, you know, in jiu-jitsu and so forth. It does truly make guys your own weight feel like nothing. Yeah, I would, I would imagine so, but it's also like really bad on your joints. Well, you got to be careful, man. You yeah. got to really, really, really be careful. This is, that's a young man's technique. It's, mm -hmm. <laughs> I would not use the heavy light system anymore myself, man. Have you ever seen that video of the really old judo master rolling with all of his students? It's a black and, yes, a I black and white yes, video. I have. It's amazing. What was that guy's name, man? Wow, I don't remember. Was... Jamie, see if you can find it. Old judo master tools young students. I mean, he was. It was black and white. He had that that floating throw. That what mm -hmm. is it called? The floating drop or valley drop throw? Man, he was just like tossing these guys. Yeah, and you could tell. I mean, this was not like some sort of a kung fu demonstration. No, no, no. That was like real. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, yeah this is the guy. Look at this old dude. Wow, I this guy's this. good here, isn't he? Mifu Man, oh, Jamie's on the ball. Wow. Mafumi, Mafumi. I mean, how old was he? I mean, I believe he was in his sixties at the time. Does it say it in the uh, the description of it, Jamie? See what says it in there. No. no. no well, he's no spring that. chicken. Yeah, I believe he was in his sixties. I mean, he's got all he's all gray hair, but look how relaxed. Yeah, he he's is. so relaxed. And he's it, so frail. Well, wasn't judo beautiful? Yeah, look how he moves. But look, look how beautiful he you moves. See how he checks him with the hip. Mm-hmm. And he's a little guy. This guy's huge. Yeah, big difference in size. Like maybe like thirty or forty percent at least. 
But look at that. The guy's yeah, he's just kind of going with it. He checks in with the hip. He just does enough to have to get thrown. I mean, it looks like they're dancing. It's amazing. It's a beautiful thing, man. Yeah, every time this guy tries no, to so manipulate them. They're all wearing white belts, so that's kind of cool. Yeah. Right? No, there were no belts. That was so. That was even before there were belts. Is that the case? Look at that. Boom! Yeah, it was like, what, during the 60s or whatever, they started coming up with the whole belt system? Really? During the 60s, yeah. huh? It was so pretty it was, late. It was late in the, no in kidding. the development. Yeah. So judo all Elio throughout? Gracie told me that in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, there was one belt. At, when you became, uh, after you trained for five years, you put on a blue belt. And that signified a senior uh, student. Really? One belt. Blue belt. One belt, that's and it. And then when the judo... Uh, uh, started with their belts. The jujitsu also did around the same time. So when did the black belt get introduced? And that was when the colored belts were introduced. I believe it was during the sixties. No kidding. Yeah, I know pre World War Two there were no belts. Look how beautiful and effortless that throw was. That was just gorgeous. Effortless. This old frail guy just using perfect technique. Just so much knowledge. So just, much knowledge. Look at that. Look how beautiful that is. The guy tries to do to him what he did to him. And like, this no. kid is going for it, too. It's mm -hmm. not like, I mean, he's showing respect, but he's, he's trying to throw the old man. There's no doubt that he would. Yeah. He just knows. Well, he's, he's, yeah, he's not, um, he's not trying to bully him. He's trying to use technique. But look at that. Oh, my goodness. It's amazing. I, we, I just love watching that. I love, love watching that. And there's, there's really a difference in this in comparison to striking arts because, you know, if these guys were kickboxing after a few leg kicks. Well, as long know. as you know how to uh, do your break falls, you can. Oh, God, that's so beautiful. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's no. Yeah, I mean, I find that with the grappling arts, you can pretty much keep going for much older. You're but, certainly much older than sparring with striking. But, you know, it's. Uh, I was telling you about this book I'm reading about the history of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And uh, they're talking about, like, the Japanese when they first came to America. It was the first clash of cultures. The judo men were finding that they couldn't stand up to the American catches catch can wrestlers. The Americans were bigger, stronger, faster, heavy. They couldn't take them down with a lot of those throws. A lot of the wrestlers won't wear the jackets. That's where the guard really became developed. Really? They found that if they could pull them into the guard, they could dispatch them with wow. arm locks, triangles. Sometimes they insisted that the wrestlers wear the jackets in these fights, like uh, <laughs> like Maeda. And then, right. of course, they could set the choke pretty easy on these guys. Very fascinating book. It's, it's really fun. I bought it off Amazon. I have it on my Kindle. I'm halfway through it right now. I'm just to the point now where Maeda starts teaching Carlos Gracie. Wow. But the history of the sport is absolutely fascinating. That's incredible. Have you um, been paying attention at all to Metamoris? Oh, Yeah. Well, my yeah, son. your son, of course, yeah. Zach. That was a tough match for him. Yeah, man. well, like he doesn't do no gi. That's not his game at all. He's always only doing gi. Yeah, and I said, holy shit, for your first professional black belt match, Gary Tony, jeez. Yeah. Could you have picked a, like a harder guy? Yeah, Gary Tony's coming on this week. We're gonna I have him really, on the podcast. This I week. really questioned, you know, like, wow, that's. He just said, hey, you know what? I, I just wanted a challenge. I just really want to fight. The, the top guy. Mm -hmm. And Gary Tonin, anytime you talk about Nogi submission wrestling, that name's up there with the best, man. Did you see his match with Kron? Oh, my God. Amazing. I don't, I don't even know how Kron pulled that out, man. He's a, I mean, it just shows how tough Kron is, right? Yeah. But, yeah, it's like, so, yeah. So, um, Metamoris had Dean Lister versus Josh Barnett. Josh Barnett, of course, representing catch wrestling. Josh Barnett even came out like an old catch wrestler, like a little old, yes. bikini um, the old shorts and, yeah, the and shoes. wrestling shoes, and tapped Dean Lister with a headlock. Yeah, with that that judo headlock from from side control. All you guys out there, you blue belts and purple belts, don't forget to practice your headlock escapes, man. Yeah, you, because you know in jujitsu training, no one uses the headlock because mm -hmm. it's usually pretty easy to escape from. Also, you give up your back, kind of. Exactly. When you get out of a headlock, you're in a pretty crappy position, right? But if you don't practice it, man, you can see what happens. I mean, you get a high-level athlete like Josh Barnett, who is ridiculously strong. Yeah. And he slaps it on you by surprise. Even a professional like Dean, and I, I mean, Dean probably knows 100 escapes from a headlock. But, man, you get caught by surprise and get locked up in that thing, man. You know, that same position— I was actually giving a seminar for the United States Secret Service. I used to go down. They were just a 90-minute drive from my gym, Philadelphia. 
And I, uh, I got to know some of these guys through Pavel. And I used to go down and give uh, self-defense seminars as well as conditioning and kettlebell seminars. So one of the guys was an ex-wrestler who got me in that position that Josh got Dean. I made a big mistake, man. The guy says, well, how do you get out of this position, you know? And so I lay down and leave him do it to me. But the son of a gun cranked me with it and popped both of my ribs. And I was crippled for eight weeks. Wow. Yeah, it was a pretty jerk thing to do. Of course, you know, typ typical herky-jerky type of wrestler. I was one of those guys myself at one time. But I just realized how dangerous that position is. That's how Mark Coleman beat Dan Severn to win the first ever UFC heavyweight title, that same exact position. And I'll tell you, man, it is a power move, but man, if a guy knows how to do it right, it freezes your diaphragm, it can dislocate your ribs, it could even cause some spinal damage. It's just horrible to be caught in it, and you go into an immediate panic. But, uh, yeah, you can really get hurt with that. Not, not just neck, but ribs. Yeah, it's a power move, but isn't a guillotine as well? I mean, there's, there's sure, a technique there's, to it. But There's a technique to it, man. You certainly have to have some strength to pull it off. Yeah, well, if you're wrestling anybody your own size or a little bit smaller, and in Josh's case, he was bigger than Dean, hell, why not, man? Not much bigger than Dean. Dean's not, huge now. Yeah, well, Dean's a pretty big boy. He's really big now. I mean, he's uh, way thicker than when he was fighting at 205 in the UFC. I don't know what he's walking around at, but he looked to me to be like in the 240s or 230s at the very I, least. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, he's very thick. But Josh um, Josh got him in that position. He couldn't escape, which is amazing when you consider how much experience Dean has. And uh, I don't think he'd been tapped in competition in over I, a decade. He's a hard guy to tap, man. Oh, he, so hard to his tap. His skill level, his skill set. But, hey, both guys are fantastic. And, and, you know, that's that's grappling, right, And any given day. I love also the different approaches, that Josh has a different approach. And you see that, that different approach, that cast wrestling approach can be just as effective. If he gets you in one of those positions, you know, it's it, and it might be something you're not accustomed to. So you haven't trained to get out of it. I remember... One of the first pro uh, grappling matches, it was in, maybe you remember this, it was like in one of the Carolinas, North Carolina or South Carolina. It was like, I think it was called the Pro-Am or something. There was guys, How long ago was this? Oh, man, back in the 90s maybe. No. It was real early, like late 90s. Was this the one where Frank Shamrock uh, wrestled Dan Henderson and they did like a pay-per-view thing and John Peretti was the No, nah, it wasn't a pay-per-view, but they were paying cash prizes to the guys It was like one of the early attempts to do submission wrestling as a pro sport Okay, and uh, I remember Solo was at the house. He was training Solo Ibero. Solo Ibero and He was wrestling supposedly like the number one catch wrestler. He was living down in North Carolina somewhere and I had seen this guy in other tournaments, and I warned him. I said, hey, this guy will give up his back to go for that twisting toehold. You know, like when you go, they, they loop over the toehold and kind of flip upside down and go for your foot. Mm -hmm. And I said, the guy's good with it. He's really good. And wouldn't you know, Solo takes the back, and the guy does it and pops his ankle. But Solo won't tap. He said he would have died before he tapped it as a catcher wrestler. <laughs> and, and, and then... Because he didn't tap, you know, he, he choked the guy over the face, you know, because the guy was trying to uh, hide the chin. Mm -hmm. Basically just put the guy out, man. And, uh, and, and but just, it mangled his ankle? Just, just But mangled the ankle. So he won. But, oh, my God, the thing turned as black as his microphone, man. It was like he was in such pain. God, did but he need surgery? No, nah, he didn't. He's Man, I'll tell you, Saul is another one of those guys that's just like one of the toughest dudes I've ever met. Him and his brother, Sean, are just like so tough. But, man, he limped around and was hurt. I don't know whether the ankle was ever the same, but that's one of those deals, right? With the catch wrestlers, you mm -hmm. got to watch those guys are tricky as all hell. They're doing different the things. Knees, yeah. the feet, oh, man. Yeah, it's guys doing different things and getting really good at those things. That's that's a big part of it. It's like if a guy has a like a, a foot lock or something like that, he just has down. He just knows how to do it, and that becomes his thing. I mean, some guys just have certain positions that you're not really well versed in, and they go to it over and over and over again. Like Eddie Bravo, before he got famous for doing the twister, one of the things I remember in, in Jean Jacques, Eddie Bravo would do a toehold. He was a toehold guy. 
Uh, and he would get toeholds on guys all the time because a lot of people weren't good at toeholds. So he would dive on toeholds. He was always people catching people with that. Don't know how to defend them, man. Yeah. It's a smart move. And sometimes moves are so old they're new. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like you see things go in trends and then people get good at stopping them and they kind of go away. Right. And then some older move will come back in and you see these waves. It's, uh, it's funny. Like um, I was sort of uh, anti. Bear and Bolo and some of these inversion techniques. Uh, maybe I'm just jealous because uh, you know my spine's a little bit too old and stiff to <laughs> do it. But the guys look like they're having a good time when they do it. Right. But uh, I uh, I was talking to my son. He says, "Well, Dad," he says, "you still got to learn that stuff." He says, "Even if you don't want to use it, you got to learn it to so you know how to stop it." He says, "Because for sure, if you don't know it, you're going to get tapped. You're, the guy's going to catch you." Right. So you got to at least practice it a little bit to be familiar with it. And th that being said, as in New York City, and as uh, uh, wrestling with uh, Gianni Grippo and uh, Mr. Baron Bolo, the guy's so much fun. He's one of Marcelo's uh, uh, black belts. And this kid is so good with that. And it was really fun playing with him with that thing, man. He could just flip upside down and roll and invert. And next thing you know, the little sucker's on your back. is like, how did he do that, man? Yeah, it's really interesting when guys get super sharp at one particular technique. And if you're not aware of that particular technique, it could become really dangerous. You know, um, Braulio Estima is famous for having that very bizarre guard as well, where he'll, you know, do those reverse triangles or inverted triangles. And he gets himself into a position where, for, to the outside observer, it looks like, well, this guy is like on his neck here in this weird position and then all of a sudden he's got a triangle on the guy like, and he's what? tapping people just so yeah. good at that position that was but he's good position. at all positions all positions but, but that one position he's been particularly successful at because it's such an unusual thing to defend very few people are that scary with it and it's like th some people like criticize certain techniques they go ah oh, you know i played around with that but that doesn't work well okay really well, what about like head kicks? Did you play around with head kicks and you say they don't work? Because you know how many times you have to drill a head kick to get it effective, but then you get it up to like a point where like an Anthony Pettis has it or an Anderson Silva has it, and it becomes a real dangerous weapon in your arsenal. Crocop, perfect example. Crocop drilled that damn head kick to the point where he could throw it out like another guy could throw out a, a straight punch, a, a standard straight punch. That's how good and fast his head kick was and still is. And when you you discount a technique simply because you don't have the proficiency in it, you can really, you really get caught because you, you really can sort of define the world in an inaccurate light, and then you see a guy, like maybe this Baron Bolo guy, or Eddie Bravo with his twister, or you know, there's a, a million different techniques that you're, you're starting to see emerge in MMA that guys have discarded, like the front kick to the face. Nobody was worried about the front kick to the face. Nobody. And then all of a sudden, Anderson like, knocks out Vitor. It's like, what and like, the Holy heck is Jesus. going on here? No one would ever expect it. But see, that's just the thing. I mean, you can't learn everything for sure. You know, you got to have your certain arsenal. But it certainly pays to be familiar with these positions. And at least learn the rudimentary basics so you understand it, what it is. You can recognize it because recognition is the first step to protecting yourself against this stuff. So even if you never want to use it, it, it pays to at least learn it and yeah. be familiar with it. And actually learn it offensively. There's a mistake that exactly. people do, especially wrestlers that are learning jiu-jitsu. They decide, well, I'm just going to learn defense. I'm just going to learn jiu-jitsu defense. You will never learn correct jiu-jitsu defense unless you learn jiu-jitsu offense. That's right. If you don't know how to cinch up a choke, if you don't know how to cinch up an arm bar, you're never going to know exactly what you can get away with when you're defending. And once you, once you get adapt at uh, offense, then you'll truly understand defense because you'll understand what would I would be trying to do to me if I was in this position and how do I stop this guy from doing that. All those little details, it's, yeah. it's like so, so important. Well, it's so, in, it's one of the most beautiful things about jujitsu is there's so many techniques. It's almost like, you know, you it's see. It's never ending. Yeah. And you see certain guys who have a very small wheelhouse of techniques that they utilize, especially like attacks. Like Marcelo Garcia is, of course, one of the best of all time. But he has a very, if you look at his, if you took all of his jujitsu matches that he's won and look at how he won them, it's a very small number of chokes that he's used. I mean, it's almost all. I mean, I think Rico Rodriguez. I think he got him with a leg lock. Um, most guys, he he got 
Jake Shields with a wrist lock, I believe. And one of those, uh, and uh, I remember Rico Chaparelli had a uh, professional jiu-jitsu tournament thing that he was doing in Los Angeles. Jacare competed against Randy Couture, and Marcelo competed against Jake Shields. And I believe he got Jake in a wrist lock, which is, you know, he's got some crafty shit in there. Really crafty. But most of it, guillotines, north-south choke, rear naked choke. It's almost all necks, almost a, all attacking the necks. It's it's a... Jiu-jitsu is such a complex sport. It, I liken it to, uh, like, I, I liken wrestling, being a former wrestler, more like checkers. And jiu-jitsu to chess, but not just chess, three-dimensional chess. It really is. Maybe submission wrestling would be more like regular chess. And then jiu-jitsu with the gi, with all the different ways you can manipulate the cloth, almost like three-dimensional chess. It's just such a huge variety of, of stuff yeah the only problem i have with the gi is that i think a lot of people get brainwashed into thinking that you need to learn the gi to be good at jiu-jitsu and mma and eddie bravo in particular is very adamant that that is a ridiculous idea he's like that's like saying you have to be really good at racquetball to be good at tennis yeah it's and, two different yeah. sports altogether well there's just so much to grip and you see so many guys that are world champions or they compete at a very high level with the gi and then they fight in MMA and everyone's sweaty and they have gloves on and they, they can't grab things and they, they seem lost. It's very sport specific, man. You have to develop the specific skills to, towards your fighting conditions. But, uh, you know, one of the most elegant definitions of jiu-jitsu I ever heard, and it's, <laughs> it came from Helsing Gracie. It was at a seminar in Atlantic City. This is like one of the early Gracie seminars. And uh, this is back in the day when you never knew what kind of wacko was going to walk in through there. Sometimes you'd even get people that wanted to challenge in the seminars. And there was this guy that came in, swear to God, with flowing robes, like this kung fu guy with this big <laughs> red sash. And so <laughs> right in the middle of the seminar, he interrupts, well, Mr. Gracie, sir, uh, could, could, you, could you give me the definition of your philosophy of jiu-jitsu? And we're like, oh, boy. Because, you know, Helson, his English wasn't the most, it was hard to understand sometimes, you know. Plus, he mixed it with the Hawaiian slang. But he says, win the fight. When I know I can win the fight, I can pretty much, you know, be that nice guy and kind and, and you know, loving and all that towards other people. Because, you know, I have that confidence with myself that I know I can, I can protect myself. I, I, I don't have to be insecure. So the guy says, well, could you expound on that? And of course, first we have to explain what expound means and all that. And we're thinking, man, what's he going to say here? And he, he says, jiu-jitsu, if you do this, I do that. And if you do that, I do this forever. And we said, whoa, that is some deep shit. <laughs> Let's get a three-by-five card. And I actually had that in my, my school. I actually wrote that and put it on the wall. If you do this, I do that. And if you do that, I do this forever. And it's forever. like, wow, it does. It goes into infinity, man. Especially when you're constantly moving one step ahead of the guy. Like if you, I liken it to having a conversation. Like if you have a conversation with someone who speaks very broken English, you could really kind of talk circles around them. You could just, if you're an articulate person, especially, of you, course. Know, you can make them look really silly. You'd be like, what? What are you trying to say? You're trying to say nothing. You don't even know how to talk my language, stupid. <laughs> you know, and you could just literally just rattle and attack them. I think they call it sophistry. <laughs> it's sophist, like well, a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Well, some guys, uh, and, and, you know, be aggressive and rude about it, but some guys can do that with jujitsu, where you kind of have to think yourself through every step, and you're not kind of aware. I mean, that's how I always feel when I would roll with guys who are like at a really, really high level. It's like, I'm not prepared for all the steps that you could take to count my step you know I will do a move and you will do your move but you also have all these other you you're already anticipating to counter this I've got to do that so I'm gonna stop this by putting my hand on your knee here and putting my foot on your hip here and now uh, you're gonna to have to try to get out of it but I'm not gonna let you get out of it because I'm already anticipating that because I'm and, already so far ahead. yeah like Hicks and Gracie always used to say about guys he, he's not going to be able to keep up the rhythm not going to be able to keep up the rhythm you know that like you're gonna uh, I do this and you do that. I do this, you do that. I do this. How long can you keep that up? How long can you keep that rhythm how, up? How long? Well, Helson had another go in, too. It was amazing because the guy was pretty profound in his own very simple way. The way he'd explain things it was pretty amazing. But somebody was complaining how easily he was catching him. And Helson says, look, I know everything you know and everything else. 
<laughs> I was like, yeah, absolutely. He says, maybe, maybe if I got sick or injured and was in the hospital for like three years and did train, maybe if I came back, you might have a chance. <laughs> But it's true. <laughs> but it's true. Why wouldn't it be true? I mean, the guy's done it. His, I mean, Ronda Rousey's born, essentially born on their mats. Yeah, Ron has been saying that about uh, female opponents. He's like, she was like, uh, listen, what's going on now is I've been doing this my whole life, and these girls are just not going to catch up to me. And that's what you're seeing when you saw that beautiful armbar that she landed on Zingano. I mean, Zingano attacks, that is unbelievable, isn't it? Tries to throw a Ronda, just winds up on top, recognizes the position where the arm is. I mean, I was talking to George Gurgel and uh, about it at the last UFC. He's like, that's when I bowed down to Ronda. And that's how he said it. I mean, you know, George is a black belt as well. And he's like, you know, I saw her arm bars. I was like, yeah, she's got good arm bars, but sometimes she does things that I don't agree with. So maybe her knees are a little too wide apart. Even though she's catching these girls, maybe she's catching these girls because they're just not that technical. He goes, but when she hit that arm bar on Zingano, yeah, 14 like, seconds in, it's like, whoa, look, I got to bow down. It's like, that's wow. some high level, wow. high level high technique. High level technique, man. Yeah, yeah. just the ability to adjust and again that language that she has in her head she's so articulate with the language of submissions and in her case arm bars you know just so good at arm bars what a talent huh it looks <sighs> like she has quite a budding movie career as well she's, she's not a bad looking she's, gal she's beautiful i saw that I, I saw the swimsuit this year or whatever yeah. the man she's good figure uh pretty girl tough as shit. I saw a very funny um interview where this guy was talking a little trash and she judo threw him, she <laughs> landed on him and broke on his hardwood rib. four. It yeah. was like, oh yeah. man, did she? She broke the guy's ribs. Yeah, man. she judo threw him and launched herself on, on top, top of him. Of him man. With I mean, she knew exactly what she was doing I too. By the way, so. are you she all right? Are you all right? But the guy, the guy, you don't trash talk to. Uh, you just don't trash talk yeah. like that, man. I think it was kind I mean, of what, planned what the, out in advance. What did he think? What did he think? You know, uh, he's wanted to get you, attention you, to make a video. You put on a gi and, uh, <laughs> and and then you trash talk the girl, like yeah. like you're not going to. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, people got upset when I said that I think she could beat a lot of men in her in that weight class. I don't know why they would. Well, because they don't know. Yeah. They've never rolled with a girl who's really good. I mean, like in the natural world, right? A lioness can sometimes beat a male lion. If they're the same size. Yeah. yeah you never know. Yeah. And if she has cubs, she'll risk her life. to. And maybe he could beat her, but her incentive is way higher than his incentive. So he figures it's not worth it. Well, technique is, as we said before, is paramount. And her technique is so laser sharp. If she got in there with a guy who doesn't have that good a technique, just because he's a man, the physical strength and the inherent... The, the the benefits of being a male, whatever advantages that he may have, aren't necessarily going to counter the technique that she has when they're the same weight. Now, if you're dealing with a guy like, you know, she's she competes at 135. Okay, if you deal with her versus a guy at 170 like Johnny Hendricks, like Jesus, of course that's a mismatch. Johnny Hendricks is a powerful, big, strong man, and he most likely would beat her up. But you're talking about a guy who's her weight, and then even if he's physically stronger, maybe he can hit harder, but how much of a technical advantage does she have on the ground? She could easily catch you in something in a scramble. Easily. Easily. Be well, you one, know, two, three, four steps ahead of you. For for older guys like myself, actually, the women are some of your best sparring partners. Like, the more advanced women, they're fun to train with. Because they're not going to try to muscle well, if They don't. Usually, it's rare, occasionally, but usually women won't use power. They do think differently than men. They have a different logic, and they surprise the heck out of you with some of their attacks and the way they put their game together. It's really fun. And usually women are pretty flexible, so their guards are a nightmare to get. You know, some, some of these girls with the De La Havis and spider guards are like, wow, controlling those feet or is a nightmare. Yeah, and you think about someone's guard, someone's legs have to carry their body around. You know, say if they weigh 140 pounds like Rhonda 
or 135, and you know you're carrying 135 pounds around. All by the way, she doesn't really weigh 135. She weighs 135 on weigh-in day, and then I would imagine she rehydrates up to around 150, or close imagine. to it. She yeah. she's pretty. She carries a lot of muscle in that frame. So. She's thick. Yeah, she's, she's not. Thick. She's not a skinny girl by any stretch. Yeah, she's not weak by any stretch no, of the imagination. Oh my gosh, she's very strong. And so you're dealing with someone who uh, knows how to manipulate their body, and they have these legs that are carrying around all of this weight all day long. Your legs are amazingly strong. It's amazing endurance. And when you factor that in, if you've gotten, uh, like, I remember doing drills with uh, my friend Felicia. Felicia O oh is one of uh, Jean-Jacques Machado's black belts. Yeah, I know Felicia from the old RKC kettlebell. Yeah, game. yeah, she's a kettlebell wizard. She loves that. But I remember um, doing drills with her and, you know, armbar drills, and she locks an armbar up on you, man, and you're dealing with legs. Oh, yeah. Legs are strong, man. Well, Even a, a small woman has very strong legs. Well, the difference between male and female legs is very small percentage. You know, in, in studies that they've done, uh, upper body, there is a significant difference. But with a trained woman, she can close that gap. And I'll tell you, for for you older guys listening out there, you know, you guys over forty, or if you're a guy that's been injured, start seeking the girls out for sparring partners, and you will have a wonderful technical spar session. You also look like a little bit of a creep. Yeah, so, well, mate. Heads up. <laughs> Just <laughs> don't be afraid to tap. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one with guys tapping to girls. Oh, my God. Some guys want to bleed from the eyes before they'll tap to a girl. And have you like, ever tapped to a girl? Oh, hell yeah. I haven't. Uh-huh. Uh, well. <laughs> I, I, didn't would, say, uh, I didn't say what, what content. <laughs> <laughs> I would though. I mean, I'm sure Rhonda could probably tell nah, me. Nah, man. I, if I if I get in a bad position, I don't care who it is. If, yeah. it's, if it's a child, I'll tap. If 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 uh, now now I'm to the point where my days for fighting out of stuff. If I'm if mm -hmm. I if I make the mistake and I get in the submission, I have to assume that if it was a person of equal skill to myself, I'm submitted. Mm -hmm. He got me in this position. Fighting out of it isn't really technique as much as just strength or whatever, you know, pain, mm -hmm. pain tolerance. Right. I, 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 I mean, there are you. technical escapes. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, like, you know, the, mm -hmm. the joint's straight. Right. Okay. Especially when it's fully locked in. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. He, he got me straight. Yeah. Or tough. the choke's set. Mm -hmm. It's just pain tolerance and or whatever it's also the 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 price you pay just to keep your ego healthy like physically i remember um my friend brent got me in a kimura and i didn't want to tap and i fought out of it but i couldn't do chin-ups for months yeah, the injury my elbow happened. was so jacked i couldn't do chin-ups for the long and i just remember every day i would be at the gym when i was lifting weights going why the fuck didn't i just tap because I would be fine right now. Like either it was the same thing happened. I've tapped to him before. He's tapped me before, but I just would not tap. And I'm like, ah, yeah, you're just in that mindset. Out of it. But you got to treat it like it's basketball. Yeah, if someone I mean, scores on you in basketball. It's not the end of the world. You get the ball and you go right back in. Or you're playing softball and you pop yeah. fly out in the outfield, or you get thrown out at third base. So what? Okay, yeah. you'll get another chance at bat. But uh, a lot of times, like like you said, even though you do fight out of it, you are successful. The injuries already occurred, especially with the neck, and you might not even feel it at the time. But then it's like, oh mm -hmm. shit, this really hurts, man. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was as damaged as it was. Maybe you're a little bit adrenalized, or that's why I love the uh, the saying that the uh, like Henner and Huron, you keep it playful. Keep it playful. That's a great way. It's a great philosophy, and it's a great way to teach. You know, those guys have uh, really done an They've amazing really job. They've really blossomed, man. I met those guys when they were just like little tiny boys they're so enthusiastic too it's very contagious yeah, they are they are very enthusiastic like they're, those gracie breakdowns that they do that go over the techniques that guys use in fights to win fights it's like it's very it's, it's it really makes you want to train they're they're great assets to jujitsu they're great ambassadors i think so too yeah. I, I, lo I love the whole uh, street fight thing that they do and they show like uh, the right things that people do and the wrong things mm. i mean they get some pretty uh, intense street fights on there sometimes. So you're in town for how long, and you're doing some seminars around here? Yeah, you... uh, actually, uh, I came here just to see you, and then uh, I'm going to be in, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether I should even mention it on your show, but uh, Loveline with uh, Dr. Drew. Why shouldn't you mention it? Oh, I mean, you know, it's kind of a 
isn't it like a, a com- competition podcast or something? I oh know. no, nah, okay. no! I don't think about it like that at all, ever. No, 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 no. I was, well, I have a lot of friends doing that. That's just, not fun. That's an old school radio mentality. Yeah, well, I, I know, you know, I'm, no, I, I support everything. No, nah. so yeah, that that was a weird, weird one, man. I, I just they just called out of the blue. Apparently, the guy's been following some of the anti aging stuff of doing the, uh, not Doctor Drew, but the uh, Mike. Yeah, the comedian guy that's on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, I've never done anything like that before. That's like, whoa, uh, that should be interesting. I, yeah, it'll be fun. Tell him I said I, hi. I had no idea, you know, like what to expect or. Tell him that you're getting into pot. Yeah. <laughs> he's actually he's actually come around about pot. Him and that Sanjay Gupta well, guy from CNN, they're if, all coming around. Man, if I came around, you know, yeah. it's like now that you're seeing it get legalized. But yeah, I was I was a little concerned because like I wasn't sure is it going to be like a Howard Stern thing where they try to make you look like an idiot or right? No, you know, no, 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 no. I I understand it's actually a pretty pretty uh, pretty cool show. So um, I'll be doing that Strength Matters Summit in San Diego. That's 20th through 22nd March, San Diego. I'm teaching a body weight workshop. Where can people find all of this stuff? Just on my website, maxwellsc.com. www.maxwellsc for strength and conditioning.com. Okay. And all, all the upcoming things. And then, of course, the El Salvador Lifestyle uh, Jiu Jitsu Training Camp. Show you all the uh, all my anti aging secrets and nice. hopefully, the, you know, mobility and conditioning and uh, Jiu Jitsu. Big emphasis on the self-defense aspect of it, but also we'll have some other young guys there uh, for competition stuff. And then uh, I just came out with the five-pillar workout system for kettlebells. I have a, a mo- uh, like a movement-based exercise. I had a, a one with the uh, body weight. Now I came out with the kettlebell five-pillar movement system. Just released that. And I'm going to be making one with the barbell five-pillar. So. Nice. And here we go. This is the uh, the website here, yeah, maxwellsc.com. We and uh, you also custom tailor workouts for your clients uh, through the internet, right? I do. I discovered a long time ago, about 15 years ago, that uh, a lot of people, they don't need someone to handhold them through workouts. They have the incentive to train. They just don't know what to do. So I do diet programs, fat loss programs for people, help them wade through all that huge information. I've had my own personal diet wars with, with myself and I pretty much figured out a way to, that you can keep lean year round. So I help people with diet, fast loss and you know what to do. There's so much uh, information and misinformation. How do you put all this together? You know. Yeah, it is difficult. It's, it's difficult to come up with a time to do all the research yourself. And it's all based on goals, by the way. There's so many different ways to crack the nut, so many different systems, and they all work more or less. It just all depends on what it is that the guy wants. So people really need a lot of help just sorting that stuff out. So that's what I do. And uh, extensive questionnaire. Uh, I analyze uh, photographs for structure, you know, uh, postural stuff. And then uh, you get a a custom workout program, and you send me training logs, and I review them and send the information back and do progressions with people and so forth. well, I can't recommend uh, you highly enough. Well, uh, thanks. I appreciate all it. the years that we've been friends, I've just gained a tremendous amount of information from you and all the times we worked out together. We're working out tomorrow, too. Yeah, so man. I'm, Damn, Joe, those guns are... <sighs> Very excited about that. Um, so anybody who's interested in any sort of uh, strength and conditioning workout, if you want to mix it up or you just want to just tap into the database of knowledge that is Steve Maxwell, Maxwell SC.com and all of these upcoming seminar dates are all available there and you can all check out uh, uh, on Twitter it's Maxwell SC on Twitter as well right yes it is Steve Maxwell SC on yeah, Twitter Steve right Maxwell is. all right thank you brother appreciate hey, it man, man always a good time we yeah, gotta do this more fantastic. often fantastic you're a traveling nomad though man yeah, you're all man. over the world thanks we got him here for a little bit all right folks uh, we'll be back tomorrow take care bye-bye Awesome, Joe. Thanks, man. That's fine.